hijack open. Mm -hmm. Go into scratch folder. Good. Go into scratch folder. Thanks for reminding me I need to order some Gillespie coffee. Yes, yes you do. Yes, I'm you do. Go show that. Months. Yeah, it's starting to drop right. off. I think people are looking at the economy and they're saying, hmm, do I really need to drink Gillespie's coffee? Of course you do. Well, I was thinking on um, yesterday morning, I was thinking about this, is that you need to come up with a breakfast blend and call it Poo Brew. You know, that's only about less than 50% of people that have that effect. I know. You posted about that, I think, last week or something, or two weeks yeah. ago or a month ago. It all yeah. blurs together for me. Every day that ends in Y blurs together, but... Like, we talked about no, the, the the days of the week last week yeah the, the amount of dads that would buy that coffee blend poo brew but what if it didn't work it doesn't see matter. it's a dad joke it's like a novelty item it doesn't have to work it just has to be cute and <laughs> novel you know like church <laughs> yeah the shipping to us is the joke and the only oh, place I can ship ridiculous. The only place I can ship reasonably is Canada, and even then, you're like going to pay as much for shipping as you do for the coffee. So what's crazy is that last summer I was shipping out shirts and stickers for the Warrior Priest podcast, and I was paying between seven and nine dollars per priority mail, and now I'm paying thirteen to fifteen bucks for priority mail. It's just crazy how quick the price went up. Actually, mine went down, but I but I'm in some kind of pricing program with the U.S. Postal because I ship so much. There you go. That's the way to do it. Mine went down like. Uh, Five cents, ten cents, twenty cents depends on the package. Yeah, I like that. But fuel price is going up, so I'm sure they'll raise them again. Oh, absolutely. Well, yeah. everything's going to go up because inflation's going through the roof. Spoiler alert. No, it's not. Fed says it's only one and a half percent. Yeah, and my investment banker says otherwise. <laughs> well, they, one fifth of all the U.S. currency was printed in the last year. Yeah, I know more than and yet time in U.S. history. To get. And yet, interest rates are only one and a half percent. Or excuse me, yeah, inflation is only one and a half percent. Interest well, rates that's, is zero. that's how money works, right? Currency manipulation? Yes, that's exactly how currency works. <laughs> it's like unmanaged currency. Is like whose line is it anyways? The questions are made up and the points don't matter. <laughs> <laughs> that's so true. That's so true. Oh, should we actually get after the, the proper point of the show? Yeah, let's get after the proper point of this show, which is right. masks don't prevent the spread of COVID, social distancing is antisocial, and the vaccinations are gene therapy. There we go. Now and we population can control. Evil. Now okay. we can talk more about evil. <laughs> All right, I'm going to record. And I hit dots. Mm -hmm. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. This is the Band Books Podcast, episode number 200. Did I do it? You did I did it. it. What do I win? Nothing. And we are, as always, your host, Christopher Gillespie. Who's going to fade out so you can actually hear me. There we go. No, Chilling, just willing. Just go on loop. Just Maxing let it go relaxing. on loop in the background the whole what? episode. Oh, just let it play the whole time? Just in the background. <laughs> <laughs> just uh, back it this off. Is... Like, as far into the back as you can get it in, in oh, the speakers. Oh, okay. Or you could just pan it back and forth throughout the episode. <laughs> Oh, uh, well, not. happy uh, happy Monday, everybody. It's the second week in the season of Easter as we come to you with this episode. I don't really have anything to start off the show with other than it's the end of a civilization and uh, the gospel thrives in crisis, so there's only good times for us. Well, it does, it does create a contrast that I think is helpful and mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, the church becomes, <laughs> well... Practically speaking, it's become like the only place where you can act normal, at least for us and our parishes, because right. of uh, the choices that we've made. And I would say only for us in our parishes. <laughs> well, very few parishes. I have, uh, I've got more people. I think you've had this experience too. That are now like, you think we might just go to this church because we still can't go to our church. <laughs> I'm sorry, well, I can't control them. I can only do what I think is best here, and mm -hmm. uh, I'm glad to have you. You know, right? I'm not trying to tear you away from anywhere else. It's just like. If they've chosen to still meet virtually, which is meeting fakely, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, right. yeah. sorry, I can't help that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we live in a fake society, so <laughs> why, would, right. why would you suspect that the church would behave any differently? Well, it's kind of like uh, virtue signaling, right? You say, mm -hmm. it's not virtuous. It is signaling still, I suppose. We're actually going to get into that on today's podcast about evil, because oh, good. Simone Weil actually talks about virtue as being a false front for evil. Huh. Yeah. How coincidental is that? 
Yeah. But Prophetic this came even. up over the weekend, too, to the point, and then we can slide right into evil, actually, is that I asked the question again at Bible study because we're doing a series on fear, and I asked, how would you know whether God has passed judgment on you and taken his word away from your people or not? <laughs> and Because you'd answer, probably, you'd enjoy it, right? Right, because going with Paul, he gives you what you want most. He gives you the desire of your heart. Right. And therefore, God's judgment feels like free will. It feels like you got blessed, actually, because you got what you wanted. And because you believe you believe in God, when God actually gives you over to judgment, when he gives you over to evil, you will actually praise, thank, serve, and obey him, mm -hmm. thinking this is good. And this came up in the context of, of Jesus and the calming of the storm in, storm in Mark chapter 4. And the disciples believe in God, but they don't because God's right in front of them and they don't see him. And he says this, you cowards, how is it that you still don't believe? Right, right. And the religious leaders of all the people in Israel who believe in God, who know God, most intimately, it's the religious leaders. They don't believe in God because God's right in front of them and they execute him. This is, to me, what is horrifying about God's judgment then is that you believe in God, but you don't. You God don't reveals himself God. to you too. Right. He reveals himself to you in the way of both repentance and belief. Repentance mm -hmm. and forgiveness, believe mm -hmm. because the kingdom of God is at hand. And yet you will refuse to believe that it is him because you already believe in God. A different one. A different God, but you believe it's the true God. That's the dichotomy inherent in being a sinner, yet having faith. You mean you don't come as a blank slate or an open canvas or something? Right. No. You come with your gods. Right. So that if I were to say, hypothetically, that God has passed judgment on the United States and removed the gospel from the churches and left only a remnant, that would be denied because, well, look at all the churches. Look at all the priests and pastors and ministers. Look at all the Christians. Uh, to which you could say <laughs> that is not proof no. of God's presence in and through the gospel. Yeah, it's it's challenging too. I mean, because the analytics, uh, despite what you observe or like what I observe mm -hmm. in this community, I mean, we, we're in a relatively conservative county and area, a bunch of farmers, mm -hmm. right? And uh, right. religious types. And, and so, I mean, it's going to be a holdout, but it's like you haven't been in the city then. You haven't mm -hmm. been um, in suburbia. I mean, right. you haven't been in these places where, you know, majority, 70, 80, 90% are non practicing uh, people of any yeah. sort. Yeah. All right. And uh, it and they make if you if you call them up on the phone, they'll say, "Yeah, I'm a Christian." Right. How often do you go to church? As much, you know, kind of a while. They just flat out lie about it mm -hmm. because it's, you know it's keeping up appearances, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you look, right. but even then, the, the honest surveys are like statistically, it's less than half of Americans go to church regularly. Right. Any church, not right. just Christian. You're like, oh, I would say less than a quarter. I think realistically, it's quite a bit less than that. Yeah. Right. And then like. Uh, We've got uh, in our chat here, you know, somebody from Australia, and yep. there it's there it's probably I, it might be single digits. It, mm -hmm. I'd be surprised if it's double digits at this point. Well, in Australia, and New Zealand, where they're in a full blown totalitarian state, we can't even really practice as a Christian. Can't really anyway. practice your religion without getting arrested. In Canada, you saw um, mm -hmm. a church. They tore down the barricades. That was in yep. Edmonton, I think. They tore down the barricades and they sent two hundred cops in. Yep. So, uh, yeah, but you that's and what... I warned people about this way back in the early 2000s when they passed laws about hate speech in the pulpit because we Correct. both know pastors in Canada. were arrested yeah. in Canada for right. preaching against homosexual marriage in our nation. And so we knew 20 years ago this was coming because they had priming, already... right? Yeah. yeah, laying the groundwork, yeah, little by little. And so, in the beginning, you say, Well, it's just those guys, the lunatic fringe, the, mm -hmm. the real hate mongers, the fanatics, and then slowly but surely more and more people are pulled into that net until you have, well, we're going to surround your church with 200 police. And if you set foot on this property, straight to jail. Yeah. I mean, remember if you even dared to try to defend some really nut, you know, nuts like a uh, Westboro mm -hmm. Baptist or something, Yeah. which I mean, granted, um, we don't support what they said preached no. at all. No. Right. No. Uh, on the other hand, we say, well, but if we take their freedom to do so away from them, correct. We'll be next. Right. And it's, it's like free people are free to be idiots and to be really terrible people. Yeah, they actually mm -hmm. are. If they're yeah, not, until the ATF shows up on your property. 
Well, now the new head of the ETF is the guy responsible for right. the Branch Davidian yeah. destruction, right? A little bit of little bit of fire starting going on there. Irony. Posing, it's like, posing wait a minute. for a picture in front of the charred bodies of children. That's classy. That's really classy. Yeah, but that was a while ago. Maybe he's uh, kind of come around now. He's uh, got a selfie with him holding up a picture of it on the anniversary of it. <laughs> okay. Smile. So he's he's very proud of those actions. Yeah. No, he looks like an evil henchman in a movie. Yeah. There's Australia for you. Full of mega churches and gospel free. Right. Not free gospel, gospel free. And so this brings us to then the point. Thanks, Paul, for that uh, about Edmonton. But I think this brings us to the point. And this is why we're coming back to Simone again. Again, agree or disagree with her, at least in my reading of it, it, uh, it provokes me to think. And it provokes yeah. me to really ponder and really chew on my presuppositions and how I'm thinking through these subjects. And so we covered idolatry in the previous episodes. Or was it one episode? Idolatry was one. One episode. We didn't so, split it. It was about a, it was a little over an hour. So yeah, we we're, it as, as evil, this section on evil is a little bit longer because that one was like two pages. This is mm -hmm. five or six pages, so we won't go through the whole thing. But it still goes to the point that, like Dr. Luther says about the theologian of glory or the theology of glory, it calls good evil and evil good, which goes back to my point about God judging us and taking the gospel from us. And how would we even know though? Right. right. And that's and, that good and yeah. evil. What, how would we even know? What do we even know right. uh, as good and what is evil? I mean, because I can say for a fact that I know that I've been judged by my peers in one way and judged by my district president in another way. Praise mm -hmm. be to God for that. Yeah. Um, that I have the support of my district president and those in the office. But to, to say what you're doing is, is, sinful or not godly when you are claiming to stand against evil. And this is something that we've discussed in elders meetings at my congregation. I've discussed this with my council before is that when I am called as a pastor to serve a congregation, according to my documents, which are right there behind my head, uh, it says I have to preach the Lutheran confessions. Like I have to abide by the Lutheran confessions. And that means I have to preach law and gospel. I have to preach the law lawfully and the gospel evangelically. Mm -hmm. In order to preach the law lawfully, I actually have to point out evil. It's kind of inherent in preaching the law lawfully because you have to call out that which is actually antithetical to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I can hear the accusation coming, which mm -hmm. is like, we're not talking about law and gospel. We're talking about practical matters. Correct. And, that, and that's not... Uh, so principled, black and white, it's more a gray right. area. Right. And so, yeah, yeah. so, you know, so you you're saying about, something's evil, yeah. but right. maybe it's just immaterial, or what do you want, what's what's in between good and evil? Uh, indifferent, I guess, is the word we use. <laughs> what's what's in between good and evil? I don't know, Hollywood? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but no, that's evil. Uh, that's truly evil, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, no, I mean, who is who is truly good, right? Right. Jesus alone, right? right. God, so, so only God is good. So there's this whole, you know, well, self-justification project where you're always trying to call yourself good Correct. and not recognizing that even, even your best attempts at, at following after, mm -hmm. you know, even following the law in particular um, mm -hmm. is always faulty and short and, and thus right. always sinful. Well, I brought this up yesterday in the sermon and, and we've talked about this in the past is that I give credit to the Roman Catholic Church for at least preserving the theology of the body. Over That's the true. centuries, because well, they things. would say they restored it. I mean, that was John Paul. Yeah, I'll give you that. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, I at least give them respect for that because, in we were talking before we hit record, is that when I preach on the body or body, soul, and mind, and it being a gift from God, that our life just us being here is a gift. Like God chose to give you life. You don't you don't deserve it. You're not entitled to it. It's a gift. And then you treat your body and your soul and your mind like trash that is to right. just be thrown away. Right. And then you treat other people that way because that's how you see yourself. As long as I talk about the body in a generic sense, in an abstract sense, and I don't call out the evil ways in which we pollute and destroy our bodies with sin and death, that's fine as long as <laughs> you keep it abstract. Yeah. But when I start being specific about the foods and the drinks and the things that we inhale and things we inject into ourselves that are truly sinful and evil, now all of a sudden it's close to home because you have people in your church, you have people in the congregation who are listening to you saying, well, wait a minute, I do that. Are yeah. you saying that I'm evil then because I did mm. that? Mm. It's like, well, are you implicitly participating in this or complicit in this? Yeah, we've talked about that with um, things like mandatory vaccination. It's like, mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think we should restrict people's ability to get the vaccine. On the other hand, um, I don't think we can mandate that people must get the vaccine. 
right? And why is that? My body, my choice. Well, you could use that. I mean, that's actually true in a sense. (laughs) Um, The the other flip side of that, though, is that you do relate Mm -hmm. to your neighbor. And there there Mm -hmm. is a responsibility that you care for yourself for the benefit of your neighbor as well. So Mm -hmm. you don't go around. I don't know. We've gotten mocked for things like, I don't know, like chicken pox parties. You've heard about these things. Mm -hmm. You know, a relatively non-serious disease for children. Correct. But you don't want to get it as an adult. Get the virus as an adult. It develops into, what is that? Shingles. Shingles, yeah. Yeah. Um, So, you know, you kind of want to be exposed to it when you might get a few scars, but that's about it. Mm -hmm. As a child. And, Mm -hmm. well, like, how dare you expose your children to it? Lethal disease. And it's like, well, it's not lethal. Not for children, no. Right. All right, well, but but you got to keep them safe. I'm like, well, okay. It's like the the nerfing the world, the the playgrounds. The, the, it's really the myth that uh, they talk about in um, the narcissism. No, it's not in that book. Uh, what was the book that it, uh, the two authors they talk about the anti the children are anti fragile. I blown it out. Down in the American mind, Johnny. Kent. Yeah. The, yes, that's it. The no, 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 not dumbing down in the American mind. Yeah, the one with height and uh, what's his name. Anyway, it's the first chapter yeah. I think. Where they height talk about how <laughs> I hate Ashbury. No, but it's spelled the same way. Uh, is just, it Johnny can't spell. Johnny can't. No. Sing, Johnny can't read. <laughs> One of those. No, it's the uh, something of the American mind. I think you're right, though. I thought I thought it was the dumbing down of the American mind. Mm. Shoot. Too bad we don't have access to the internet. <laughs> well, it's kind of terrible here. Coddling of the American there mind. There we go. Coddling yeah. of the American mind. Yeah, they they talk about the myth of fragility that the mm-hmm. children are are fragile, and it's actually no, the children are far less fragile than you are. <laughs> Have you ever read about the Spartans (laughs) or the Norse people? It's not like you put children in harm's way. That's not what we're talking about. I do. Do you? Yeah, of course I do. My my kids are in jujitsu. They fight. Right, but that's still a controlled environment. But I'm saying though, is I still you still do it. You put your children in harm's way. They still get injured. They get hurt. I just think about like my childhood and like my parents would be like, just go play on the playground, just go. And it's like two blocks right. away. They're not even well, there. That's what I'm saying though, is that we were allowed to be exposed ourselves to those things. Whereas now, like you said, the nerfing of the world is, it's not allowed. So you actually have to seek out a gym. For example, you have to put your kids in competition where they have to fight. You have to seek danger almost. You have to seek it. Exactly. You literally as a parent have to put your kids in danger, so to speak. But like you said, in a controlled environment, because you're not going to say, okay, go play out on the highway and dodge cars. Yeah, like that that but, would be. But my evil. point is, is like, is that is that evil, right? To put them mm-hmm. in harm's way, not like climb a tree. Like, well, but they might get right. hurt. Well, they might. Yeah. I mean, the danger doesn't make it evil. Mm-hmm. And so that I think that's where we've we've had this uh, inability to do a risk calculus, right? Well, we're pussified. The entire yeah. society, our whole society, is pussified. We might say feminized. But that be that would be then feminized, be, but emasculated is probably better. Feminization and I yeah. know we're not like against women or anything like that. It's just I'm very you know. pro woman. I I love women. <laughs> I think they're great. <laughs> I praise God for them. <laughs> you know, you've got daughters and a wife, so exactly. I hope so. Exactly, and and we have a rule in my house: you can date my daughters when you can beat me in a fight. Ooh, it's very proud. You're really narrowing the gene pool there significantly. <laughs> <laughs> You want to talk about traditional. <laughs> All you wow. have to do is beat me in a fight. It's good to go. And you also have to have a house. My Mexican dad taught me that. If a man doesn't have a work ethic to buy a house and provide for his family, then don't let him marry your daughters. Well, you might have to adjust that based off of uh, what's happening to the economy here. Hey, I'm just saying, learn how to build then. Take up carpentry, provide for my family. Let's go. Our standards are just far too low. That's the yeah. problem. Is We've just allowed our standards to become so base- that any person that exhibits even the least amount of ability in any area is astounding to us. Mm. That's that's what fuels a lot of YouTube channels. People with a basic set of abilities profit off of it. So, I mean, I guess we're tra- we're dancing around a little bit, but good and evil. Mm-hmm. We're not talking about this kind of what comes off just being gray, just mushy, non There's just no standards. Right. Well, I think that's the problem that we have in postmodernity is we've, cre- again, the Hegelian synthesis, that there's mm-hmm. a, this huge gray area and then the fringes are black and white Yeah. versus how I see the world, which is there's black and there's white. There's only one who is good, God, mm-hmm. in a theological sense, in a philosophical sense, since we no longer actually study and embrace ideals such as virtue, courage, bravery, 
right. wisdom, justice, righteousness, kindness, charity, compassion. These aren't virtues anymore. They're not inculcated. We don't expect our children to exhibit these behaviors as they're growing up. And the reason is actually to your point, because we don't force our children, we don't put our children in situations where they're forced to actually have to exhibit these characteristics and then encourage that, the, the growth and the promulgation of those characteristics. Well, ultimately, yeah, you can't develop those characteristics unless you're free to fail. That's what I'm saying is that like in my kids Muay Thai class, you know, you bring them along, you, 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 um, build their confidence slowly, you build their skills slowly. And then eventually you say, okay, you guys are going to spar today. And now it's going to be very controlled. It's going to be very low key, very low intensity, you know, cause you don't want anybody to get hurt it's your right. first time. And I'm trying to build up their confidence. And so my 10 year old, my son got a good uppercut right to the nose hmm. and you know, his, it wasn't hard, but it was shocking. It snapped his head back and his eyes started to water and he's trying to control himself so he doesn't cry. And then I just said, Hey, you know, walk around the mat a little bit, walk it off. You're okay. You're not bleeding. It's okay. He walked around a little bit and I'm like, go, you have two and a half minutes left in the round. Go. He finished the round off. I said, okay, take a round off, go sit down. And then I went and sat down next to him. I said, you see that you did that. Like you toughed that out. Like you went through that. And he's like, yeah, I did. I'm like, see how much tougher you are than you thought you were. And he's like, yeah, I guess I am. I'm like, no, you are. And then I you just are now. Like that. Yeah, you are now. And just like that, he's back out on the mats and he's doing, he's sparring again. Right. But like I said, you, you, you don't run to him and, and say, okay, no more for you. This is too dangerous. Like we're done. Um, but at the same time, you don't say, Hey man, you know, don't, don't act like whatever. Don't be that way. Get back in there and fight and prove that you're my son or blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, you, in the moment you have to understand you've put him in this stressful situation. These are the consequences that can happen. And now that they've happened, how are you going to manage this? How are you going to deal with this so that they grow from it? They learn from it. And now you have that courage. You have that that purpose and, and you grow from that. And again, that's in an earthly neighborly sense, but mm -hmm. that's what makes kinder people. That's what makes gentler people to be in those stressful situations, to be humbled by those situations, to grow from those situations. And then in the rest of your life, then all of a sudden you're better able to manage stress. You're better right. able to relate to other people who are themselves struggling. You're more compassionate and kind. You're less prone to violence, by the way, and emotional outbursts. Like all of that's happening in this cauldron of stress and, and exposure to these situations. Well, I guess that's what I was getting after. Is I, like I made the suggestion yesterday that doubt is, um, is a gift from God. And, mm -hmm. and people, I know people get a little upset about that. It's like, no, you're supposed to trust. I'm like, no, you can. You might want to start there. Right. Um, but, but people let you down. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you can't take everything as gospel truth. Um, mm -hmm. not even from your pastor, right? I mean, you're right. Challenge, push back. If you're not sure, if you're, if you're, if you've got that sinking doubt, I mean, that may be a revelation of your unbelief. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but then I, I know what people are thinking like, well, doubt's evil, right? It's just inherently right. bad. And it's like, no, it's right. neutral. What do you do with it? Of course. I right. mean, if you just sit on it, I mean, that might be evil, but, right. but if you use it to say, I'm going to go investigate this, I'm going to try to resolve this doubt, you know, mm -hmm. find evidence or listen to right. you know, whatever it is whether it's secular or spiritual, it doesn't matter. Right. Uh, that now it's, now you're, it's being used for good. Yeah. Right. For God's purpose. And I think that's the distinction I, that I, that I like to make mm -hmm. is to say, well, if it's evil, it's because it, it leads you away from faith and it leads you out of love. Right. Right. But if exactly. it's good, it's going to lead you into faith um, and into love for your neighbor. Correct. Even if it seems to be evil, like a disaster, like you, uh, Oh, we'll just use a practical example. Mm -hmm. So you live on the island of St. Vincent's, volcanoes yeah, right. going off, right? Yeah. Uh, the good thing to do would be to say, let's help get people off this island. Right. <laughs> to safety, away from an erupting volcano, right? Right, yeah. Uh, or you could say, you know what, we're going to use this arbitrary, um, you know, uh, thing called a vaccine, mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to decide which people get off and which people don't based off of this. Now, that, right. to me, that's truly evil. Never it mind a evil. violation of Nuremberg Code right. of one one thing and probably other human rights violations well, in, in the process. It's gene therapy. It's a serum. Well, never First mind. I mean, foremost. I'm not talking about the just the the vaccine itself. No, I'm just, just saying, saying building up from that is like a you're selling a lie to begin with, right? And then you're compounding that lie by suggesting that okay, well, if you don't do this, then you're not allowed on this cruise ship, which we're just going to leave you here, which is. Right. You're, again, you're just piling sin upon sin, which we're actually going to get to. And then to Wes's point, I think as we read through this, hopefully it'll help clarify for Wes too his question. Oh, about past restriction of the of preaching. 
right. to limit COVID spread. Yeah. Right. That's like, uh, what, the last nine months of uh, yeah, shows. Just so. Wes, go back and listen to the last nine months of our shows. <laughs> you can listen to them on two times speed or something. But yeah. yeah. So to evil, Simone Weil from the book, Gravity and Grace. This is the topic of evil. Creation is good broken up into pieces and scattered throughout evil. Evil is limitless, but it is not infinite. Only the infinite limits the limitless. You want to dive into that one? <laughs> only the infinite limits the limitless. Mm -hmm. So only God can uh, set up the limits to things. Correct. Is what Correct. we would say. And mm -hmm. that makes sense. I mean, because he, uh, like, well, in, in God's own character, um, namely in his son Jesus, right? Is mm -hmm. that there's a humility there where God um, limits and, and only occasionally um, reveals you know, the fullness mm -hmm. of the Godhead, right. um, you know, think of the mountain transfiguration or something mm -hmm. like that. But most of the time, Jesus is sleeping, he's eating, he's drinking, he's, mm -hmm. you know, as, yeah. as true man. Right. And, but God can do that. Correct. I think, I would say that the whole of Revelation is a limiting of the limitless. Right. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, like the picture of heaven, you're, and I was thinking about mm -hmm. this in regards to the garden and how, you know, heaven is kind of the... It, it, well, the Revelation vision, anyway, the apocalypse. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, well, that's pretty fantastic sounding, John. I don't think I really understand what you're talking about. And he's like, I don't either. Yeah, right, right, exactly. It's <laughs> that's not about just what, understanding; it's about the it, mystery. I'm doing the best I can with what what the limits of my both perception and language, mm -hmm. and you know, and right. all of that. Yeah. Well, and this goes to the point too. Vile, you know, kind of self um, defined herself as a mystic, a Christian mystic. And it is a popular trend within mysticism and Trinitarian theology mm. to talk about the self-limitation of God. That when God created the universe, if God is all in all, fills all things, is in all things, comprehends all things, then where does God create the universe? Mm. And the answer for the other mystics was, well, he has to you know, basically make space, like give away space within himself, so to speak, pull back and create space to create in. Yeah. Whereas, again, I don't think in Scripture that's really a problem for the Israelites. You go no. all the way back to Genesis, they don't seem to have a problem with the fact that God's everywhere but right there. It, it's not a problem for them. Mm -hmm. For Paul, it's a problem with the Greek worldview, the Greco-Roman worldview. It's a little bit more problematic. But for the Israelites, they don't, they don't, they don't suffer from the need to, to, to divide God into or substance to and Or to comprehend and, 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 yeah, exactly. and completion. Yeah. And I think that's why over the years I've become more and more an Old Testament scholar than a New Testament scholar and, and focus more of my attention on the Old Testament because it just jives with my sense of I don't really need to know. I don't, but I don't really think that's I don't think that's the New Testament project. I think that's maybe the modern day one, but I don't that's sure. not what that's not what Paul's doing. No, but it's that Greco Roman worldview where he has to actually address it. <laughs> I Whereas suppose. For the Israelites, they don't, they don't need to address it. It's not an issue. It's not like the Egyptians are like, could you break this down a little bit more for us? Is, is well, he I, flesh or is he spirit? Is like, what is he? I suppose that's why we gravitate towards the Gospel of John is because yeah. it, it is more of the, you know, grandiose, mysterious, you mm. know, vision that, that we get in the scriptures. Sure. You mm. know. Huh. Uh, what about the statement that comes right before that, which mm -hmm. is the, uh, but evil, evil is limitless. Mm -hmm. but is not infinite. So it, so it has, how is it both limitless, but not infinite? Well, it's, res, it's restrained, but, but to say restrained would mean that it has no, that it has a limit. It's limitless in this world, but it is not infinite. It will not last beyond the ah, I see. judgment. So one is time and one is, is, uh, what pervasiveness or something. Yeah. The absence of chronological time or measure. So, so evil, uh, we'll experience evil in all aspects of our life, yeah. but not forever. Right, and she gets to that as it comes. Okay. Monotony of evil. And again, remember, we talked about this last episode, but for those who didn't listen, these are all from her notes, letters, journal, or, you know, she's writing to herself. These were never so, intended for publication. A farmer compiled it together. Yeah, yeah, a friend of hers. Farmer so it almost, slash philosopher. <laughs> it ends up being, uh, like we talked about, more aphorisms. aphorisms yeah. Or, or like per proverbial almost, mm -hmm. right? Like Proverbs. Monotony of evil, never anything new. Everything about it is equivalent. You mean like equality? <laughs> hmm. Never anything real. Everything about it is imaginary. It is because of this monotony that quantity plays so great a part. A host of women, 
like Don Juan, or of men like Selimene. Selimene. There we go. Nice job. One is condemned to false infinity. That is hell itself. That's hmm. fantastic, by the way. I love that statement. That's why I highlighted it. It is because of this monotony that quantity plays so great a part. Isn't that true, though, that, that evil, that we actually seek to increase evil in our life right. because we get bored with the evil we already have? <laughs> right. Right. I mean, I substitute sin for evil, and that it probably makes yeah. even more sense. Yeah. It's like, but it well, is I've monotonous been... because everything about it is equivalent. I like that. It's all about equality. Of uh, uh, It's like, oh, well, it's all the same. Because as she's going to get to, evil can't actually create. That's only divinity that creates. Mm. Evil can only just basically feed upon what has already been created, which means it can't create anything new. It's limitless, but it's limitless in its monotony. But I think we, we push back on it in regards to, specifically to the scriptural definition of sin, but I think we can do it with evil as well as to say not all evil is the same. Yeah, well, a lot of evil is actually good. What I do you mean? I mean it's good, like evil being good. I mean that evil passes itself off as good. Right. And we call it good, even though it is inherently evil, which mm. she'll also get to. So evil monotony is, means, yeah. what does it mean? Mono. Just doing Mono, the same thing, one with thing the over and same over tone, and over. right? Yeah. Right. Having the same tone, for <clears throat> dull uniformity, irksome mm -hmm. sameness. Yeah. I like those definitions. Tedious repetition and routine, yeah. lack yeah. of variety. Okay. Yeah. 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 Boring. Which means... Oh, that's is, like uh, that's like in Sherlock, right? With yeah. the... the Bored. The Bored. <laughs> Bored. <laughs> Remember when he's like, okay, go. And then they're supposed to like tell him why he should date their case. He's like, Bored, next. <laughs> Not just Sherlock, but I'm thinking of Moriarty. Mm, yes. That that's was right. his famous he line. He's like, boring. It's like, he's bored with himself. He's just trying to find, you know, yeah. somebody who can keep yeah. up with him That's right. in, his, in his evil. <laughs> yes, exactly. Because <laughs> he's trying to be more and more interesting. And there... <laughs> well, that's a great example, actually, though, that you thought you've brought it up, is that how many times watching Sherlock have you thought to yourself, I'm not quite sure he's the hero here. It's Sherlock almost Holmes? As if, yeah, it's, it's almost as if Watson's responsibility within the show, like Watson is good. He mm -hmm. is inherently morally good. He's the conscience. He's Jiminy Cricket. He's the war. He's the war hero. A, and yeah, yeah, he functions yeah. as he functions as the boundary, the barrier. I would say Sherlock's the moderator. Mania. Yeah, mm -hmm. he moderates Sherlock's mania because I think that's the point: is that Moriarty recognizes with a little push, Sherlock could become malevolent. Which well, is arguably, he's smog in the Hobbit, but yeah, I know. Arguably, <laughs> in the show, he's pretty close. He's yeah, right on I'm that saying, edge. Though, yeah, yeah. No, he says I'm a high functioning sociopath. In the first episode, maybe I don't know how faithful that is to the to the books. I haven't read them in a while, but mm -hmm. but uh, I, it certainly fits our time anyway. It does. In the books, I always thought of of Mycroft as being more that that kind of mm. right on the edge of being maliciously psychopathically evil, and Sherlock being more. I don't know because of the era. He's yeah, more I like suppose. that bon vivant. It's, it's, he's, he just, people just don't understand him because he's mm. so smart. Whereas right. I feel like, um, Cumberpatch portrays him as being, again, right on the edge of that. And then Mycroft comes in and you're like, Well, oh. he does go insane. <laughs> yeah, that's true too. For a while. Yeah. I had to rewatch that show. That was a great series. Third series was a little sketchy, but the fourth one kind of came back strong. Mm -hmm. In my opinion. So evil is license. And that is why it is monotonous. Everything has to be drawn from ourselves but it is not given to man to create. And so it is a bad attempt to imitate God. There you go. There you go. And by the way, um, so Dr. Luther defines sin as being curved in on one's self, which mm -hmm. in a modern colloquial way of saying it is just self-centeredness, selfishness, being focused on yourself. And so if you think of evil in the sense of it's entirely selfishness, self-centeredness, self-focusedness, then all evil is, is licensed to focus entirely on yourself all the time. But we have a problem, don't we? Because like Which is uh, why she says, everything then is drawn from ourselves. As Jesus says, you know, out of the heart comes all sorts of manner of evil, yeah. manner of evil right? So, so if, if we're the ones responsible for creating mm -hmm. solely, exclusively, yeah. um, that will be by nature evil. Yeah. That's why, you know, the humanitarian project or even the humanities, as they said, 
I've always wondered about, you know, that term. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, being a hu humanitarian, often what, what passes off as humanitarian seems not quite to be that. Correct. And, and I think it's that, maybe it is that substitutionary thing like we talked about with idolatry, trying mm -hmm. to put ourselves in the place of God. Right. And we're just not very good at it. Mm -mm. Which we're is here. why, going back to my point a moment ago, that's why quite often evil is good. Or we pass it off as, yeah. That's what okay. I'm saying though, is that what we call good is inherently evil because we are trying to create something that cannot be created by us. And therefore we're trying to fix or help or, or what do you want to say? We're trying to do something that only God can accomplish. Well, I mean, I think that's our, our probably our criticism of, you know, the globalist project <clears throat> in particular, Sure. which, which has many, many areas. And before we went on air, we were talking about currency, but I, mm -hmm. but I think it, you know, it applies to like food production and the way they want mm -hmm. to centralize that. And, yeah. and even like we're making, we're eating burger that's grown in a lab and, mm -hmm. uh, and insects and I don't know what else, mm -hmm. um, you know, pea to try protein. to, Lots right. Of pea Whereas, I mean, it's a fundamental denial of at least the revelation of Genesis, which says have yeah. dominion over creation. And mm -hmm. here's the, here's the things that are good for you to eat both at creation, mm -hmm. but then also after the flood, you know, right. right. It's like, here's, here's your food. God says, right. here's your food. And then we're like, mm -hmm. you know what? I think right. we could do better. Right. If we grow it in a lab, if we process it in a plant, if right. we, you know, that is, if, yeah. Well, this is yeah. this. Is, so we'll ignore the two largest polluters of the world because mm -hmm. we have to because all our factories are over there, and then we'll eliminate cows because really cows are the problem. Yeah, it's what is it? A th it's at least a third of the greenhouse gases come out of China and in India. Yeah, in India. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I well, think you put the two together. It's responsible for half. Yeah, it's got to be half More between half. the two of them. Yeah, and so our little like whatever Green Deal things we do. Are going right. to have such a small impact on the on the grand scale, right? But we got to do something. We have to do, do something. Do versus we? Versus, how about if you do nothing and allow nature to do what God made it to do? Stop well, interfering. You, you think it can correct itself? <laughs> yeah. Well, we like for an alone. extinction yeah. event. <laughs> Is that a correction? Good. Somebody calls it evil. I suppose. What was it? What was the other stuff? Oh, like uh, we've talked about climate control, right? Mm -hmm. I guess I yeah. guess the the whole project to um, mm -hmm. to block the sun for a while to cool down yeah. the earth um, mm -hmm. they they struck down that they're not going to do that uh, they, they gave them permission but then then they so pulled close. it back yeah I know I bad why. because uh, it was literally in a movie <laughs> what was it silver dioxide or something what were they yeah, putting going to put in something. the clouds was, and yeah or sand like, or really uh, dude did you watch the Matrix and be like yeah that's a, obviously a documentary series we need to follow through on like come on man well that's what sci-fi has basically become. Mm -hmm. We have all the Star Trek gadgets, right? That's we true. own them. Yeah, but you go all the way back to even H.G. Wells and Jules Verne, and they're like, yep, this is happening. In a I know why, though. We watched the video yesterday. Mm -hmm. Is that this is all alien technology, and they're manipulating That's our... right. You, did you enjoy that video? I enjoyed that greatly. That was phenomenal. We his should summary share that. Of that, video, that. His summary in that video was phenomenal. I watched that right after church. It was so good. Everybody got into it. We've For never even watched the show. I'm referring to, I discovered a show or I discovered a channel where he summarizes all 16 seasons of Ancient Aliens, and it's brilliant. It's so The good. History of the World According to Ancient Aliens. I'll put yeah, it in it the is phenomenal. Uh, show notes here. Oh, just, yeah. It's hyper entertaining. It's in the chat. That's but right, don't watch Simpsons it now. Watch it later. Sun. Was that when um, Burns dropped that dome over uh, the town? <laughs> so I think, d things. didn't didn't Walt Disney want to do that too? He wanted to have a dome over Disney World. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he did. Yeah. To control the environment there. Mm -hmm. yeah 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 nice but that's good right it's good i don't know i, I like those uh planet what do they call them not planetariums the places yeah, biodomes the domes. biodomes yeah yeah well we we got to figure it out so that when we get to um go to mars we learn how well, to i was there. gonna say that isn't that though the ultimate human aspiration is for all of us to have our own biodomes it was but then wasn't there a movie with uh Polly shore there was uh Polly shore and stephen baldwin <laughs> I can't remember and it And then now. we tried the, let's try it without the dome part last year. And people were like, I actually really like this. <laughs> what, just watching Netflix and- Just stay at home and not go outside, yeah. And getting a guaranteed income for doing nothing? Yes, because that's good, right? That's not evil, right? That's not morally evil. That's not encouraging uh, sin. Uh, okay. I mean, obviously, we have to assume that the government doesn't exist to protect the preaching of the gospel and that it actually exists for other reasons. And we also have to assume that our, our hearers, watchers, um, understand sarcasm. 
<clears throat> yes. I told you, I'm not good at sarcasm. I'm good at, at No, we're really good at sarcasm. <laughs> and unfortunately... I'm bad at satire. I'm good at sarcasm. I'm bad at satire. There you Different go. Passwords. There we go. It is. And you have to, you just have to laugh and smile. Otherwise people don't understand. Oh, read, just read the first five pages of Watchmen and I, I think you'll get it. Mm -hmm. That's true. Just, just the first couple pages. So evil is license, and that is why it is monotonous. Everything has to be drawn from ourselves, which means everything that comes from ourselves, theologically speaking, is evil. Period. Full stop. Don't try and apologize for it. Mm, Romans 3. Yeah, okay. Romans 3. Romans 3. Yeah. Romans 7. All of Romans. <laughs> it's really kind of the thesis of Romans, yeah. Yeah. Not to recognize and accept this impossibility of creating is the source of many an error. Yeah, exactly. We are obliged to imitate the act of creation. And there are two possible imitations, the one real and the other apparent, preserving and destroying. So here are the two imitations of creation. We imitate creation, we imitate God, the creator, by either trying to preserve creation, climate change, or destroy it, climate change. Huh. Climate change. Water supply, uh, giving people LSD in the 60s without their knowing about it, injecting black people with syphilis in the 50s, chemically castrating and performing hysterectomies on Native Americans on the reservations in the 70s and 80s. Mandatory COVID vaccines for... Mandatory COVID vaccinations. For military? US military. For military. They're trying to force that through now. Yep. I saw, what was it, 40% of Marines refused? Refused, yeah. Yep. And like... What, According what's to Zogby... 32% of Americans don't trust Fauci and think he's working for the pharmaceutical companies. What? I can't believe that. 32%. 32. I'm like, not 82? Not 92? Not 100? And it's, what are we and it's, n it's not a political position. Mm -mm. Even though he is the highest paid government employee currently. Working. Well, no, that's what I mean. It's the people's rejection of Fauci right. is not a political position. No, it's, of course not. It's actually like follow the money. It's a, it's a basic right. principle. Right. of like any kind of uh what do you want to say criticism right and say what 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 vested interest do you have mm -hmm. in does, in this product or in this idea yeah well let's not speculate i mean this is a theological podcast so let's stick to the facts what does the bible have to say about money it's the root of all sorts of evil oh yeah that's right <laughs> <laughs> there is that so you think you should be an unpaid employee yeah you know what I, that's an interesting point because that's what You're that's a what uh, turned you that's what Trump did. He returned all his money, returned his mm -hmm. paycheck every year, or mm -hmm. donated it to something else. Whatever he did, yeah. That was an interesting thing. It didn't get a lot of press. People didn't talk about it. But you notice, hey, he's the first president in a while that hasn't come out highly enriched, mm -hmm. but actually lost, what, however many places in the in the world as far as his wealth? Yeah. He lost like an eighth of his wealth, I think. Sure. In his time in yeah. office. Whereas... I think it was, yeah, when Obama went in, he was worth like 125000 150000 something, like yeah. something like that. Yeah. And now you get, somehow these well, book deals governor, are, are really, I, I really Minnesota. lucrative. My governor came into office worth a couple hundred thousand. Now he's worth over four and a half million. Or what happened? Million. I'm sorry, he's worth over 400 million. What it's did like, he? weird, dude. You, you don't have any income on your tax returns, but somehow your wealth has increased uh, like, oh, 400 million? Hmm, weird. Little governor, little state. Uh, I think we could say that, I mean, I'm not, I'm not opposed to people making money, um, making money, mm, right? Earning it, <laughs> working earning for it. it. I'm not opposed to people earning it. Yeah. I am opposed to public servants profiting off of their public service while they're in office because of the very fact that money is a temptation. I know we're getting off on this rabbit trail a little bit, but um, mm. I think it's important. There is I do, actually. We talked about this or at the end of last week, you and I talked about this privately and we can talk about public, it's fine, but is that like last year with with everything that our congregations went through, what we're going through personally in our families, when someone offered me a chunk of money, <laughs> like a good chunk of money, for most people, it'd be no chunk of money. They'd be like, I, I make that at like waking up in the morning. But for me, for my Like a lawyer, salary, $900 an hour or something. Yeah, exactly. But for me, it was yeah. a good chunk of money, especially in a time when you're like, oh, well, is our church going to be here in a year? Will I have a job in a year? How am I going to provide for my family right now? And <clears throat> there were strings attached to it. It was a contract and I accepted it. And then after the fact, I was like, mm, now I'm beholden to the people and I'm under contract for this money. And now I don't know if I want to continue to follow through on the contract. I think I want to break the contract and give the money back. 
and I cite that as a benign example, but it's still an example of temptation. Someone puts money in your face, no matter how principled you are, depending on the crisis, depending on what you see as a need, right? you're going to take that money in good faith, so to speak. And it's not malevolent because both parties are going in with their eyes wide open. This is what we expect and this is what you've agreed to. It's not like that. But nonetheless, money can tempt you to make decisions that under different circumstances, you'd say, yeah, I don't, I don't think principles wise, I should, I should compromise. So, I mean, our, the founders of at least our country recognize that this More is a temptation, a significant temptation. I mean, there is an article in the constitution. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a emoluments clause, you know, emolument. Mm -hmm. That's a weird word. It it, we don't ever use it for anything else. It means... It's hard to pronounce. That's true. A, sal a salary fee or profit for employment or office. Hmm. All right. So note, it, uh, this is section nine, clause eight of article one. No right. title of nobility shall be granted by the United States. Right. So we don't have uh, king and queen there. Mm -hmm. No person holding any office of profit or trust under them shall, without the consent of Congress, accept any present emolument, office, or title of any mm -hmm. kind whatsoever from any king, prince, or foreign state. Right. So... Yes. So this had <laughs> exactly. So it had to do from coming from other people. Well, right. So if you're enriched by say a business China. in Ukraine or in China or, or yeah, just Russia or wherever, um, is that an em emolument? And the courts, I don't know, have ruled very definitively on this. The key was that you're not getting a, di a direct payment from even a gift. Who was it? Somebody right. was given like a golden sword or something. One of these mm -hmm. like Jackson or somebody. Yeah. Uh, and, um, uh, and that he went to Congress and said, can I accept this sword? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, because it's worth some money. Right. And it comes from the, yeah. uh, and he had, he got approval. And I said, yeah, yeah no, you can keep the sword at school. Sure. You know, but uh, now it's like, there's all sorts of, I, I, I don't, yeah. I posted some things on Facebook, just showing the interconnectivity of our politicians and of our corporations mm -hmm. and of foreign entities. Right. And then all of the NGOs and non-government organizations, yeah. the way they yeah. funnel the money right. here and there. Like, I don't even know how you could even possibly um, dismantle or unravel the mm, way right. the enriching right. activities that are happening between all these organizations. Right. Um, well, because I mean, more, you, more politicians are lawyers, right? I mean, they're going to get away with it, obviously, as long as they get well, elected. Just, I suppose. Just to understand what your job is, you have to be a lawyer, <laughs> just to be able to walk through all of that. So I just look at it and say, well, okay, is that is it evil? And you said, well, it's a public office, and so you can't enrich yourself from the office. Um, but, uh, think about like ex-military, right. And they go into, uh, military contracting afterwards sure. after their yeah. active service, mm -hmm. right? Well, how can they serve? They, and they end up making good money doing that. You're right. right. Maybe more than they did in service, although they mm -hmm. still get to collect their pension if they completed sure. whatever. So, well, let's um, go but, down, let's but go why more, let's well, go more close to home, more, more local. Cause that's obviously so far out of our wheelhouse as far as oh, yeah. the, the amount of money that's being, you know, that's training hands. <laughs> Um, what about pastors being enriched, enriched by their ministries outside of what they're salaried? What do you mean? Um, getting paid to do funerals, paid to do weddings, paid to show up, paid to do this, paid to do that, rather than just doing it because it's part of their call, their ministry. Well, I mean, I don't know about your practice. My practice is I'll accept gifts, but I don't, um, I don't, right. de I don't demand it. So I don't charge mm -hmm. fees. I know this right. came up, I, this came up in Africa um, with our missionaries mm -hmm. over there because sure. The, Ro the local Roman priests, through the negotiation of all of the missionary organizations in the area, mm -hmm. it's, the Romans got to do the baptisms. Okay. But he was charging effectively, I think in US dollars, it was like $50, so a lot of money. Um, and it became an issue. Like, because yeah. my, he, you know, the, the Lutheran missionaries got people who can't afford it. Like, right. as, uh, so it actually becomes a prohibitive to the gospel in that mm -hmm. example right. because he's charging. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I would take a gift, but then what do you do with the gift? And right. yeah, like, I don't, it does get a little tricky, doesn't it? It does. Because, you know, to wrap it up and go back into the point in the book, mm -hmm. but this is why in the history of the Christian church, the church has always enjoyed a very healthy skepticism of the state. And that the relationship of the Christian church to the state has always been marked by a kind of antagonism. We kind of expect that they're enriching attention. themselves though, right? Well, it's the point is you're going to persecute us at some point because that's kind of how this rolls out. <laughs> and, and therefore we are going to be highly skeptical of you in the state. And the state has always been skeptical of the Christian church or suspicious of the Christian church because our fealty is not to the state, but to God. 
because we go back to Acts, Moses. Like they're, you know, God's word, not the words of men. And I, I, Queen Joseph mm -hmm. and, and the place of honor that yeah. Israel has in Egypt to the 400 years later. Right. You know, when, when, they're, when they're the slave class. And like, right. so what happened in between there? How did, right. how did they get from point A to point B? Now it's 400 years, so long time, right? Infinite time scale, anything can happen. Look at, what, look at how quickly it happened in the United States. What, you're saying we're, we're a slave class now? Yeah, 100%. Hmm. I think the church suffers from slave morality up and down the line. I mean, that's well, we, why. Well, we've, we've subjected ourselves to slavery. That's what I'm saying, though, is that that's how it happens. <laughs> Through the act of preservation or the act of destroying, right? How do we, <laughs> the two imp impossible imitations of God's creative work is to preserve or to destroy. And it's fairly, of, isn't, isn't yeah. it fairly easy to do if, I mean, all you have to do is dangle the right carrot, it seems Correct. to me. That's what I'm saying. This is why the early analogy about, or the example of money. Is that Just incentivize, need, incentivize yeah. the slavery? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Because according to scripture, the human heart wants to be enslaved. We want to be told what to do. We want to be obedient sheep. It's just a matter of who do we want to be enslaved by? Who do we want to be obedient to? Keep quoting Bob Dylan on this, right? Everybody's got to yeah. serve somebody. Yeah, serve somebody. Might be. So heaven, then might Vile be continues, there is no trace of I in the act of preserving. And here's the problem. There is an in that, there is in that of destroying. The I leaves its mark on the world as it destroys the world. There is no, tri, there is no trace of I myself in the act of preserving something. Mm. Truly preserving something. There's no me. Because you're not doing it for your sake, you're doing it for the sake of the other, for the sake of the neighbor. And in the, in the act of serving the neighbor, you lose yourself, you lose the I, because it's not about you, it's about him or her. And preserving for them, walking with them, supporting them in such a way that they are enriched and that they are bettered by your presence rather than you profiting off of them. Yeah. There is no I. Mm -hmm. Which is why I teach the kids that there's no such thing as true selflessness. There's no such thing as loving your neighbor as you like selflessly. You can't not be selfish. You can't not be sinful because it's not, well, that's bad and that was selfish and I shouldn't do that anymore or I repent of it. No, that's not your problem. Your problem is that you don't recognize that what you call good is also selfish because the only reason you do it is because it makes you feel good. It gives you some sense of satisfaction. So ultimately the, the worst, I mean, is it the worst kind of evil or is this slavery to oneself, to your own passions, your own desires and wants, or is it, because I mean, to be enslaved mm -hmm. to another, I mean, think of like Paul with, um, in the letter with mm -hmm. Onesimus and Philemon, right, right? right? It's only one page. It's not long, mm -hmm. um, but ultimately it's like, no, just go back and you're a Christian now. Now you can relate to your master in a way. Mm -hmm. I know it's not chattel slavery, but it's still, mm -hmm. you no, know, go back and serve him. Yeah. Treat be a good, be a good slave. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's well, remember, obvious. Yeah, go remember ahead. Remember in the in in the episode on idolatry where she made the comment that you can't love yourself. Mm. Thus you're for you're basically forced to love someone else and then transform them into a version of you. What you hope to be, mm -hmm. what you want to be. Yeah. And mm. I think this is again that part of it is that what you're trying to do by quote unquote loving your neighbor is make them into an I the I that is you. It's like, well, I would like to make you into a more idealized form of me yeah we've talked about that in marriage quite a bit yeah the the distortion of of the other into yourself right mm. well you know i talk with people and i i explain like annie and i don't argue we just don't we don't argue we haven't argued in years and they're like well that's not possible i'm like yeah actually it is extremely possible you just have to figure out how not to do it and they're like well how do you do it then i'm like you have to accept that the other person is an individual that exists apart from you and is not yours to control, manipulate, or change. They're mm -hmm. a person that God created, that Jesus died to redeem, and therefore as an individual, they can think for themselves, speak for themselves, and do things in such a way that you don't have to like it or agree with it, but you do have to understand it. But you also have to realize, I mean, you're, you're not telling the whole story. If you go back mm -hmm. far enough, there were a mm -hmm. lot of arguments. Oh, tons. The first yeah. 11 years we were married was just <laughs> a chaos. Yeah, no. Right. But you were working was, through all of that. You're correct. saying, well, who are you and who am I? Mm -hmm. uh, what are the yep. things that we agree on? What are the things we don't agree on? Where, where are places where maybe we can reconcile? Right. And where are there places where we can't? And we're just right. going to let those be. 
Right. So you took the time yeah. to work that out. I mean, whether right. intentionally or unintentionally, it happens. Both. Yeah, yeah. both. Yeah. Because again, you're preserving and destroying the marriage simultaneously. <laughs> but not destroying necessarily in an entirely negative way. You're destroying that which needs to be destroyed. True. Which is you. Yeah. Your those ego, ex- your Those expectations, right. Exactly. Of the other. And, and you're trying to preserve the best parts of each other for each other. It's complementary. But you don't always do that. Sometimes you pull out some flowers with the weeds. <laughs> and then you mm-hmm. come back and go, oh, wait a minute, that was, that was good. We got to bring that back. And then God beats you down by giving you children and responsibilities. So this two possible imitations, the one real and the other apparent, is either preserving yeah. or destroying. Mm-hmm. So to preserve is to, is to shut down the I, the ego. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, to, I mean, we would say conservative. To be conservative, mm-hmm. right, is, is re, re, requires you to kind of step back <laughs> yeah. and say, yeah. I'm going to take me out of this equation. I'm going to say, what is, mm-hmm. what is the inherent value of this thing, whether I like right. that or not? Mm-hmm. Okay. So it does seem like preserving, destroying. I mean, I'm not saying liberal is inherently destructive that that mm-hmm. approach it might i think we think it's constructive but something yeah. is 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 possibly going to be destroyed or overcome or well, set aside what we have though is going back to the earlier point liberality is just the re- repetition of the same over and over and over again you're not actually creating anything new you're not doing anything new but it seems apparent it is apparent it's not real it's apparent you're not doing anything new you're just giving license to doing the same thing over and over and over again call I would it argue something that, else I would argue just maybe the con one the context, but also maybe the form or the structure of it will change, even though the uh, the right. well, you put on a maybe intent kind of or lipstick and dress them up yeah. in a different kind of you know set of clothing and go see totally different. And you're like mm, that seems like totalitarianism. <laughs> well, and it does make sense that when you start to think about you know comparing our current situation to previous situations, mm-hmm. whether from scripture or otherwise, or even things right. like proverbs, mm-hmm. like uh, the emperor has no has no clothes, mm-hmm. like. Can that describe the current situation? Well, it does. Well, is, so is that some kind of like universal, you know, story? Yeah. That we right. keep repeating? Right. Uh, yeah, it is actually. Right. Well, you That's see the this wisdom in the church of it. all the time. Jesus is true man and true God. Like again, going back to Mark 4 and the boat, Jesus is sleeping because he's a man. And mm-hmm. then he stands up and scolds the waves because he's God. Mm-hmm. He's, it's not like he, sw- he turned a switch. He's like, oh, wait a minute. I got to do this. Click. Uh, settle down waves. Okay. Click. I'm back. No, he's fully man and fully God. Therefore, every heresy in the Christian church that's Christological is always the same heresy, just dressed up in different clothes, which well, the is conceited, to deny the two natures of Christ. The conceit of the story is he's sleeping in the boat, and yet he's not worried about the waves. Correct. Because they're his waves. Yeah, they're his wave. Exactly. Yeah, he made them. Yeah, that's what I said. I'm like, what are you worried about, dude? I made all this. Like, if we drown, I'll just raise you from the dead. It's not a big deal. But for your sake, I'll rebuke the waves. Right, effectively. Exactly. Because you don't Cowards. believe you're going to be safe. Yeah. Yeah, you don't believe it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Good. It's crazy. But so good. It's such a great example. Because they is. were then afraid of him. That's who in the Greek is text, this? for those who don't know, in the, <laughs> when Jesus says, because again, in the English text, it's a terrible translation, where it says, you know, why are you still afraid? Don't, why, or he says, why are you afraid? Why is it that you still don't believe? Mm. And then he calms the waves and then says, the disciples were afraid and said to themselves, who is this? In Greek, it says, you cowards, how is it that you still don't believe? And then the disciples afterwards were struck with phobia. They had an irrational fear of Jesus because they then ask, who is this guy that can do this? No, it's reverent fear. Yeah, no, it's really not. (laughs) And then that sent me down the rabbit trail looking up all the other instances where people were afraid of Jesus in the disciple Mm -hmm. corral. And it's the same thing every time. They're phobically afraid of him throughout his ministry. In the way that the, it would be of the appearance of an angel in the Old Testament. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Like the women fleeing from the tomb Correct. on Easter morning. Like they're not running out of excitement to spread the good news. They're traumatized, they're out of their minds and they're just running to run. Uh, Mark gets that just right, right? Yeah. They told no one anything for they were it's, afraid. Exactly. The end. <laughs> yep, and there's that word again, phobos, phobia. Yeah. They're just irrationally afraid of the fact that he's not in the tomb anymore. Uh, Melody writes, in the classical sense of liberal and conservative related to politics, both may have agreed broadly, but the means by which they were comfortable with and, and the speed by which they did something was different. Mm. Sure. Yeah. I think so. I can agree with that. 
um, this is something that, going back to, hey, it always happens. In the church, innovation, it happens. And one side is somewhat reluctant mm-hmm. to, to bring in, you know, quote unquote, new things, which are never new. And then the other side is usually very quick to say, hey, this is new. This is great. This is, this is now. This is current. Let's do this. When again, it's just the monotony of the same dressed up in different clothes. Different it's always, and it's always whatever. traumatic. It's always traumatic. It really is. We, like all the readings that we've done from revivalist sermons and the juxtaposition between, well, that, you know, the old institutional church, it's let us down and those priests are, they're, they have no faith. It's just all those cold, dead Christians in those churches come out here and get set on fire for Jesus. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now what do we do? Well, we got to build a church. <laughs> we got to organize. We got to figure out who's going to be on the altar guild and who's going to collect the offering and... Wait oh, a minute. Are you no. saying it's the same thing again? <laughs> exactly. We thought it was going to be new. Right. Yeah, it that's looks the same. That's it looks different. That's why there are first Baptist churches. <laughs> that's why they exist. Because there's a second and a third and a fourth and a Berean. If, you, if you're really going to put a uh, like a fine point on it, just we're the last Baptist church. Right, exactly. That would be fantastic. <laughs> For those of you listening, our Baptist brothers and sisters, please found a church that's just called the last and only Baptist church. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to go exclusive, go all and in. Make sure on it's it. at the end of a strip mall or at the end of a street. Just make it poetically true. <laughs> That'd be fantastic. You have to drive out of your way. It's not going nowhere. That's right. <laughs> it's at the end of the world. Yes, I like that. It's very Shell Silverstein. So the Baptist it. Church at the end of the world. I, I love like it. That. It's a little so long. It'll work. To skip down a little bit. A certain inferior kind of virtue is goods degraded image, of which we have to repent and of which it is more difficult to repent than it is of evil. See the Pharisee and the publican. Mm-hmm. A certain inferior kind of virtue is good's degraded image. Do you want to... That's a softball for right now. I mean... I, I think so. <laughs> if you're on social media, then you... It's like I posted this morning that uh, someone hacked... Somebody hacked something, but um, they published on, on social media that these social media influencers, how much they're being paid by what the pharmaceutical companies to virtue signal that they got vaccinated? I got a uh, email from my congressperson actually warning about accepting funds to promote the vaccine. Yeah. And that was before that came out. And I'm like, no kidding. He was getting ahead of it. I'm like, yeah, he was saying it was a scam Mm. and maybe it is. You do get a free t-shirt though. (laughs) Along with a large cash payout. (laughs) uh, Or what was the, what was the, Oh, it was the donut. It was the donut, yeah, right? Donut or a free bottle of uh, beer from a certain oh, brewer, that's great. which ironically is named after a dude that would definitely burn down the house if he found out that the company named after him was doing that. Mm. Go, go read, go read Sam Adams' quotes someday. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, what were we talking about? Emolument? No. <laughs> Virtue. <laughs> Virtue. Emolument oh, what is something. good? Right. So, like for example, being against racism. A bad idea. Well, mm-hmm. it's a good thing. Mm-hmm. Is if you're pointing out like privilege and giving privilege to one race over another, that's racist. you're becoming racist. Yeah, yeah. That is. No, you haven't become like, racist. You are a racist. <laughs> Flat out. Period. You're a racist. You're participating in sin. You're promoting it, actually. Huh. This is this is the danger of one not teaching actual virtue based on classical philosophy and two, just making it up as you go. The tenets of classical virtue are integrity, dignity, practical wisdom, and temperance. These are like the four pillars of virtue in in Greek society. So integrity, doing what's right, even though everyone says it's wrong, right? Standing up for what is right in the sense of what is righteous and good. And then you better have practical wisdom to apply to the situation, right? And what that means, temperance, all things in moderation, and um, dignity, yeah, that is self-worth. Mm-hmm. You have to actually value yourself as an individual. And because here's the funny thing, if you actually value yourself as an individual, you tend not to devalue others. If you stand up for what is just and good, you tend not to participate in what is evil. When you have practical wisdom, when you embody practical wisdom, you tend not to engage in foolishness. But if you don't, you're left with this inferior kind of virtue, which is just goods degraded image. And then you can burn down a city 
yeah. call it good. Yeah. Because you're fighting racism by looting a store owned by, well, black people. It's insanity. It's just truly, it's a spirit of oppression and insanity. You are literally a slave to your own cravings at that point, mm. your own lusts. Mm. We are doing this to protest against racism because these people are unduly prejudiced against black people. And therefore we will burn down these black businesses to prove and fight against racism. There's, there's no, there's no inherent logic within, within that statement. No. But no. where I live at, it's happening again. So then to continue, well, uh, before we continue, actually, she n makes this note, right? The Pharisee and the publican. What does she mean by that? Do you think? Uh, I don't know. I'm all, <laughs> oh, <laughs> so making it our. A certain inferior kind yeah. of virtue is goods degraded image of which we have to repent and of which it is more difficult to repent than it is to repent of evil. See the Pharisee and the publican. So the Pharisee is actually sinning, committing evil by standing at the front of the synagogue and mm -hmm. saying, hey, mm -hmm. thank God I'm not like these people. So for him, it's difficult to repent of that evil because he actually believes what he's doing is godly and good. Whereas the publican, he knows what he do does is evil. And he doesn't, he doesn't try and justify it by saying it's godly. He says against you and you only have I sinned. Um, I am the sinner. So the Pharisee then believes he is good, even though what he's doing is evil. The publican doesn't even try and hide it or even try and explain it away or justify it. He's just like, nope, this is evil, period. But yeah. So the Pharisee's virtue then is a degraded image of what is good. Yeah. Yeah. But it's difficult to repent of that because, well, you're virtuous. Right. And all your friends say so. <laughs> right. But it's not a real virtue. It's just, it looks virtuous. Right. right. Yeah. No, it's actually, so yeah, it's, it's actually it's, sin and vice. Yeah. That word image, mm -hmm. I think is really helpful there. Mm -hmm. It's to say, you know, appearances isn't, the, isn't the point. Right, 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 right. No. And, and virtue is an, an internal thing. It's often revealed in your action. Right, right, but it's a char but it's character that's that's within. Mm -hmm. um, and then running back to Romans three, I'm, <clears throat> uh, then I'm not very hopeful. I'm back now. Okay, maybe <clears throat> we'll see. So then to continue, good as the opposite of evil is in a sense equivalent to it as is the way with all opposites. Now she's working with dichotomies again. Which goes back to Nietzsche, which goes back to Heraclitus, which is that when you put seemingly two opposite things next to each other, quite often they're very, very similar, if not the same thing, just like we talked about with love and greed, mm -hmm. just you're standing on different sides of the sports car. Sure. <clears throat> Good as the opposite of evil, then in a sense is equivalent to it, equal to it, as is the way with all opposites. We talked about this Again, with the whole thing about equality, the enlightenment project that we're all the same, we are all equal hmm. and that there is that, yeah, exactly. And that we need to actually overcome all differences because that's really how you solve racism, sexism, bigotry, prejudice in general, just make everything the same. Isn't that inherently ungodly? Yes. If, if, if God makes each person <laughs> unique, you know? Right. Then, I mean, what you're effectively doing is destroying humanity. You're destroying, you know, identity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're destroying what God has made and replacing it with. Mm -hmm. mm. The appearance of preserving true humanity. But again, going back to your point about the image of it, that's what you're doing. You're put, you're, you're projecting an image of what you think is humanity or the ideal society or the perfect church or the perfect person when in reality, and then you call it good, of course, and then you try and find others who will agree with you. You go and seek out others who will agree with you and they'll call mm -hmm. it good too. But this is again, the theology of glory, calling good evil and evil good. Right. <clears throat> when in, in, she points out in, in a sense, they're the same. It is not good, which evil violates because good is inviolate. There it is. 
you can't violate good with evil. True good can't be violated. In fact, it's the very nature of good that it that evil can't overcome it. It can only degrade it. It can only degrade it. Only a degraded good can be violated. Yeah. Well, so we've talked about this with, I don't know, we'll use the example of like um, a teenage pregnancy. Sure. It's an inherent, it's inherent good that there's life given mm -hmm. by God. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that life, you know, that, that gift of life has been degraded by the circumstances, I suppose. Not the life itself, obviously, the child. Yeah. But the, but the condition of it all, I mean, there's great evil mm -hmm. that now, I mean, maybe it was by rape or something, right? I mean, they're like, mm -hmm. well, obviously that's, the rape is evil, but the child is not. Mm -hmm. But to then to, what do you want to say, transpose the evil upon the good? Correct. Is, is to degrade it, to say now this child, which is a result of evil, mm -hmm. is also at least somehow... A part of a part of evil maybe right you know because the person who com who obviously um <laughs> who caused the conception was evil right and like mm, now you're actually degrading what is good right by the evil let the evil be evil you know and the situation right. of course will always remain evil but there can be good brought from that mm -hmm. Correct. and the child of course the life is always good so. right yeah but <laughs> it's it's a difficult um Thing to navigate i suppose well, but you look at it this say, way too though if good couldn't be brought out of evil then sinners at the lord's table on sunday mm -hmm. would be verboten you wouldn't be allowed to come near the, the altar that's kind of the point of the tearing of the curtain when i would say, argue there would there would be nothing you i mean you would we would end up having to live like a hermetic life yeah we we couldn't live in this world if right. if we um could flee all evil right and mm -hmm. commit no evil right then there would be no living. Right. Well, we can go to Mars. Well, you'll just take it with you. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> Sorry. Somebody's grandma once said, "Wherever, no matter where you go, there you are. Isn't this Romans 8, 28? Oh. Yeah. Works good for the good of those who love him. Right, the Holy Spirit does that. Presupposes that in the midst of evil, God uses it for benefit. Mm-hmm, yeah, yeah. How do you, well, this goes to the point then, doesn't it? Preaching the gospel in the midst of evil. Mm -hmm. yeah. Preaching the gospel and administering the sacraments in the midst of a society that says no and an authority that says, a civil authority that says no, and yet the gospel must be preached. It must. Yeah. yeah. Jesus touched lepers and didn't seem to sweat it. Well, and even in our own history, um, think of like uh, Gerhardt, for example, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. 1500 die in one yeah. year, he's in the midst yeah. of plague. That's right. We talked about that a while ago of how many mm -hmm. people in this church died in one year. And you're talking it's about like, three funerals a day on average. Yeah, a day. You're talking about a pastor who didn't even know who was going to show up for church next Sunday because they'd be dead. That's and a legitimate pandemic, by the way. <laughs> yeah, that was an actual pandemic, not the <laughs> flu. Uh, but the, the point being is that what did he continue to do? Preach, to teach, right. to visit, you know? Right. I think, by the way, that whole slow the spread thing is a myth. There, there's no spread. There's nothing to slow. Look at the actual numbers. Well, if there is a spread, there's no slowing it. Re regardless of whether there was. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Regardless of what, how you feel about the virus. It's like um, particle size, um, any kind of research before COVID. So mm -hmm. COVID is a novel virus, which apparently either means it's really big and it can be stopped by barrier methods that didn't work previously. Correct. Or, or. <laughs> <laughs> but how dare me doubt the narrative of Correct. The, the institutions? Mm. Yeah. I mean, living in the late Middle Ages as we do, <laughs> who are we to question <laughs> the experts? <laughs> it's true. It is kind of a reversion to the Dark Ages. Just cover your it? mouth so that a demon doesn't jump down your throat. Ah, the demon virus. Mm -hmm. How dare it come so How close to me? I know, right? Mm. So it is not good which evil violates because good is inviolate. Again, Jesus cannot be overcome by evil. Period. Right. God cannot be overcome by. Isn't that a statement? Do not overcome evil by evil, but become but overcome evil with good. Which <laughs> implies that even in the midst of evil, there's good there. Correct. Well, Jesus mm -hmm. in the light or in the darkness. That's where the light shines because the darkness cannot comprehend him. I guess there's this, maybe, maybe the mistake is thinking that again, that we can, that we can escape all evil in life. 
And it's, 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 it's I suppose it's parallel once, to like, we well, can escape say, all suffering. A, when you're godless, you're left with that alternative. And B, when you worship death, that mm. is the alternative. <laughs> there isn't any other alternative because well, you either have to worship cult. You have to worship it um, because otherwise you have to reconcile the fact that you can't avoid it. Correct. In mm. fact, I would back up and say that the, the chief characteristics of a death cult are the two imitations of God's creative work, which is to preserve and destroy creation. Mm. That's the so nature if, of a death cult. Because you so don't if you actually, can't, yeah. If you can overcome death, then you embrace it, even encourage mm -hmm. it, support it. Yeah. It's end like of life, the, like, beginning of life, this over and over and over again. I used the example again yesterday in Bible study. You have to worship Odin, <laughs> even though he may abandon you at any moment for reasons that you don't get to know because he's Odin and you're not. He's mm -hmm. the All Father. But you can't then stop worshiping Odin because then if you stop worshiping him, he'll make your life 10 times worse than it already is. So you can't count on him to show up for you in battle and protect you because he might get distracted and be like, eh, you're not fighting hard enough or you know what? I like the other guy now better. But if you're like, well, fine, I quit. I'm not worshiping you anymore. Oh, really? Well, then I'm going to curse your family for 10 generations for not worshiping me. So you have this arbitrary and capricious God that you don't want to worship because he's arbitrary and capricious. But if you okay. don't, it'll be worse. <laughs> we call that like a vicious circle. No. It is. So it's mm -hmm. like, I don't want to worship him, but I have to worship him because it'll be worse if I don't. Now apply that same theology to what's happening today <laughs> because right. it's always the same theology. Shameless plug for my book. But, but this is the problem when we worship God and we construct a God in our own image, it's always a death God and it's always a death cult which is why it's so fascinating in a really tragic sense for me right now to watch churches in the United States succumb to the death cult and begin worshiping a death God and yet liturgically invoke the name of Jesus. Yeah, it's not, and sing it's things not as like... if they've rejected Jesus and embraced the death God, cult and the death God. They're actually trying to hyphenate it, which again is as old as time. I suppose... And, and I really appreciate this idea that you can't, I mean, if you're going to create your own God or you're going to create a religion, if it's going to come from internal, it's only, you can only talk about the things you know. Correct. And all we know is evil, evil inherently. Death, decay, destruction. Right. The attempt to hold on to what is not, you can't, it, again, it, it withers and fades. Everything we hold on to eventually disintegrates in our hands. Right. Right. If it's not from God. Right. This so, is the point, is that if the gospel is not truly the gospel of Jesus Christ, it will literally disintegrate. As the words come out of your mouth, they will never reach your hearers, ears and they will never stay. Hmm. If the Lord's Supper isn't the body and blood of Jesus, is, meaning is, it will cease to exist at some point. That's like I, we talked about. To me, it's an act of God. It's a sign that there's a true God in the fact that the words of institution have survived 2,000 years of our meddling with God's word. I would I would argue that the church as a whole, and even that, yeah. that they're believers, mm -hmm. it is all. I mean, it's all miracle, start to finish. Oh, absolutely. But that's third article, Holy Spirit right. work. Yeah. Right. I mean, I just say, but, it's but just, it is. Well, as of course, a pastor, it is. I just I just walk. You know, I take a step back, especially Sundays nowadays. I take a step back mm. on Sundays, and I look at my congregation. I'm like, where did all you people come from? Or why are you what, still what, here? Yeah, and why yeah. are you still here? It's like, well, we need the gospel. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> For real? Like, <laughs> okay. But like, that's what I said way at the beginning. I mean, when, when we're in a situation like we've been in, mm -hmm. um, that contrast, like you said, the gospel thrives in crisis because it, yeah. because the contrast is more apparent. When we're, when we're healthy, when we're wealthy, mm -hmm. uh, when we're out, you know, not fearful. When it's convenient to go to church. Right, right. Convenient to go out at all. Then, yeah. then there's no, it, it, you look at the gospel and you say, "Well, what's the point of being, having my sins forgiven? Because I don't even know what I don't even know what a sin is. Because everything right. seems to be going just fine." Yep. And then when you see, well, no, that it's always lurking at the door. It's right around mm -hmm. the corner. It's been there the whole time. You just weren't repentant of it because you failed to acknowledge it. And, you Correct. know, to look around the corner. Right. Hmm. Well, we're not allowed to preach about evil, specifically, or even, even our own capacity for yeah. evil. Oh yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, more specifically, yeah. yes our capacity for evil and the specifics of how we manifest that. There's a, there's a great thread um, from Robert George. Um, he's Catholic, but he's a philosopher at Princeton. Mm -hmm. 
And he talks, it's from a year ago now almost, um, but he reposted it this week, uh, retweeted it, I guess. Mm -hmm. And he, he says he, he does this thought experiment with his students. He asks them, um, which of you, if you were in antebellum South or before antebellum, if you were in the South during slavery would Mm -hmm. have, um, been, been an abolitionist. And they're all like, we all would be. Well, he's like, statistically, um, it was best guess is something like 1.3%. Sure of northerners were mm. abolitionists no absolutely nobody yeah. was an abolitionist right almost nobody right right this until whole after I- the fact <laughs> until after the fact that's right that's right, right. so you, you say that the fact that oh like we're all black lives matter and you're like mm-hmm. um are you that because it's convenient or are you that because it's actually a moral you know you have this moral position yeah you know? well i don't i don't see you out in the street fighting for it so right well but then we talk about you know minneapolis is in flames again so uh, is that good? I mean, do the means justify the ends? I mean, I don't even know what the ends are. It's always the question I would ask. Okay, you're writing, destroying. What are you trying to accomplish? Right. Oh, I just want a free TV. I need well, it's new spring. shoes. It's spring. The weather's, it's, it's, the weather's nice. It's like that statement with David and uh, Bathsheba, right? That whole yeah. incident. Oh, it's yeah. spring. It's the time when they go out for war. Exactly. You're like, what? <laughs> yeah. You just go out for war for the fun of it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no. We rape yeah, and pillage do. and do our thing. Yeah. yeah. That's mm-hmm. what we do. In the spring. And we still do it. We just call it different names. Right. Yeah. But, but again, you're like, is it, is it good? Uh, I don't know how is, you can justify it. I don't know. Is it good for civil society to, <laughs> to burn To it tolerate down? such things? Well, even to, to tolerate, tolerate it. it. No. And I think this is to the point too, is that we don't even have the capacity anymore to discuss good and evil. <laughs> in an objective terms or even in a classical sense of good well, why evil, is that? vice. Well, why is that? I think it's the absence of God, isn't it? Well, it's the I'm, absence of God. It's the absence of any actual education. Well, I was going to say even more specifically, not God in an abstract sense, but God, God's word of instruction. I was thinking about this, that maybe what, what I need to do just for the fun of it, but really for my own sake is to, mm-hmm. uh, for our Bible study, actually go through Proverbs, like some wisdom literature. Because mm-hmm. yeah. we, because it's not yeah. used liturgically, you know, much like we've lamented with the Psalms, and yeah. especially the Psalms of lament. <laughs> yeah. They're not used liturgically, and so we forget how to do it. And it's the same thing with Proverbs. We forget that, you right. know, God actually supplies wisdom. Yeah. And it's often paradoxical, and it's not always yeah. easy to understand, which is fine, right. because he wants you to meditate upon it and consider it and try to try to figure out how does this apply? How, does, how do mm-hmm. I work this? Right. right. Um, but it's his word. Right. And it is good because it comes from him. Uh, and some of it is really hard to hear. Mm -hmm. Here we go. So this is a quote from Chuck Palahniuk in the book Fight Club. We are in the, we are the middle children of history. No purpose or place. We have no great war, no great depression. Our great war is a spiritual war. Our great depression is our lives. We've all been raised on television to believe that one day we'd all be millionaires, movie gods, and rock stars, but we won't. And we are slowly learning that fact and we are very, very pissed off. And I would say that now, he wrote that in the late 90s, early 2000s, now is the culmination of that statement. Isn't that interesting? I mean, I don't think he was trying to be prophetic. Because we there were there were some wars. I mean, that was mm-hmm. before 9-11. Mm-hmm. And so it was almost like anticipating, like, that's our society can't live without conflict. Well, or at also, least it can't exist in, in its form. Is that right? The movie, yeah, the movie came out in 99. I, can only hear, I could only hear you reading it, you know, and Tyler, what is it? Tyler Durden, right? Is mm-hmm. his name? Yeah, yeah. I can only hear the voice from the movie. That's right. Well, that's good. That's if, the... if if you want to listen to me and hear Brad Pitt speaking, I'm down with that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure he's a great individual, but it does have a nice voice. Yeah, but I think this is again to the point is recognizing Chuck recognized this in the in the when he wrote it in the early '90s and then comes out mm-hmm. in the mid '90s. He recognizes the trajectory and many others too too that you know. Thomas Sowell, Sowell recognized the trajectory economically. Others, so like um, Neil uh, Postman, recognized this in the eighties sure. and nineties. Yeah. yeah, they they rec- like we talked about earlier with the science fiction writers. They recognize tra- societal trajectories. They anticipate trajectories. Aldous Huxley, obviously, mm-hmm. and Orwell. Huxley, I think, was a little bit more prescient than Orwell now. Maybe. Um, well, you go back. You go uh, check out um, Huxley's lectures on uh, Brave New World Revisited. Mm-hmm. Where he comes back 20 years later and says, hey, let me update some things. I was right. <laughs> but right. what you don't understand is there's stuff coming 
that's worse than what's happening right now. Well, and what I was going to say is that, um, you know, this is probably a whole nother show. Maybe we should read those actually in some way. I don't know if we can read them spiritually, but. We can read um, them on another podcast. Oh, we might. Yeah. If we can get, get to that at some point. Yeah. The, um, oh, uh, the thing about, about a brave new world is that, that the evil in the book, the evil that in that society, mm -hmm. it doesn't even bother to disguise itself. Correct. Well, it doesn't need to. It, and it doesn't need to, and it, it makes it really hard to read. Where, whereas, mm -hmm. like you know, something like Animal Farm or um, the other Orwell, nineteen eighty four, you can almost see how people understand what's going on in that world is good, mm -hmm. right? And and we're seeing that now with things like, um, you know, uh, eliminating people from 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 the digital um, square, right? The digital mm -hmm. social square, right? Social mm -hmm. media, you know, like. And people are saying that's good because, you know, he tweets mean. And you're like, well, mm -hmm. I don't think you're going to say that when they do it to you. Right. Right. So, so that's, but that's the, the slip is to say, well, it's, it's good for some, but not for others. And like, you mean hmm. two legs or what is it? Four legs good, two legs bad. <laughs> yeah. All no. animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. By the way, yeah. my three-year-old is obsessed with that movie, Animal Farm. She watches it four or five times a week. The, an the animated one? Yeah. From the 50s, I think it's French. Obsessively. Yeah, she watches it, it constantly, huh. which I'm not quite sure how that's going to form her brain. <laughs> point, but it's an interesting social experiment nonetheless. Oh, man. I pity her. Yeah, so that which is the direct opposite of an evil never belongs to the order of higher good. Key there, higher good. Mm -hmm. It is often scarcely any higher than evil. Examples, theft and the bourgeois respect for property, adultery and the respectable woman, the savings bank and waste, lying and sincerity. Again, dichotomies, yeah. and yet they're not actually necessarily contradictory. Respectable woman. The respectable woman who's actually an adulteress. The bourgeois who respect property or are just greedy for it, which is Boy, I think stuffed. I think the savings bank being a waste, that one doesn't seem such a dichotomy anymore. <laughs> no, it really doesn't, does it? <laughs> mm. And then lying and sincerity. I think we, we understand that pretty well at this point in time. Well, I think that's what we're talking about with like, you know, the riots in Minneapolis is like, that's theft. Yeah. But to say it's like, like a Robin Hood thing, you know, like mm -hmm. they're taking from the rich and giving it back to the poor or something. It's right. like, have you met any of those business owners? Exactly. These are small business owners, they largely. Are. They are largely small business owners. And the large businesses moved. They got out. Target got out. Did they? They're like, we're out of here. Yeah, they, they removed their, their headquarters from Minneapolis. They're, we're getting out of downtown. And, um, yeah, those small businesses are owned by minorities. <laughs> That's the thing. Well, and if you're going to be really, um, conspiratorial, you'd say, well, the large businesses want the small businesses destroyed. And so they'll even support these social right. movements that go about looting and right, you know, rioting well, and just, if you, if you want to have fun, go on Google maps and Google the areas that are affected by these riots and the arson and, and notice how square they are, how geometric they are and how they're really like within certain areas of the city and they're never they never spread outside certain areas of the city it's very interesting i haven't have you seen any riots at like a mall no it's probably just because no, people don't go to malls anymore but well that too <laughs> no you can break it down by neighborhoods it's pretty i mean again being from there and having lived up there for so many years it's pretty easy when you see things you're like oh yeah so it's that targeted area. Mm, maybe <laughs> planned coordinated it's gentrification i saw it when i was in college in st paul they did the same thing uh in st paul oh they're just they're just United clearing States. it out yeah they clear it out they sell it for uh, you know a price and then profit off of that gentrification yeah well land's cheap in uh or property's cheap in new york in chicago yeah. detroit it's a yeah, good time to buy up all areas yeah yeah again yeah, we'll just, yeah, we'll leave it at that. That's a long history there too. Good is essentially other than evil. True good is essentially other than evil. Evil is multifarious and fragmentary. Good is one. Evil is apparent. Good is mysterious. Ooh. Mm. <laughs> evil consists in action. Good in non-action, in activity which does not act, etc. We talked about that before, right? Mm -hmm. um, to know when to sheath the sword. Yeah, to be meek. To be meek. 
And by the way, we were not going to get it to it in this episode, maybe the next episode, but she is driving towards the Lamb of God. That's when she says what she says about good being passive, she means Jesus crucified. Good. Actually good. Jesus, all the criminal violence of the Roman Empire ran up against Christ, and in him it became pure suffering. Evil beings, on the other hand, transform simply suffering into sin. So that's why she can say something like evil being fragmentary and good is one, mm -hmm. because that one is Jesus. Yes. I mean, there is ultimately, I think, there is one good in this world as far as a goal, mm -hmm. something to strive for, which is mm -hmm. faith in Christ, right? Correct. Everything else, you're like, you know, it can be, can be twisted or turned into something else. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, raising a family, you could do that right. because you want, uh, you know, because you just, God says have children, so you have children. Driven by the need to love something other than yourself? Sure. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. And yet people, some people have children for the purpose of you know, enslaving them and you know, sure. forced labor. I, guess. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, there's, there's easy to turn that into, into mm -hmm. evil. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, let's have this conversation since we're, it's there uh, for me anyways, is so what about the division of the church and the fragmentation of the church? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, it's, it's enough for the unity of the church that we, <laughs> that we agree on the preaching of the gospel and the administration of the sacraments, right? But we don't. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> right? But we don't. Right. I mean, yeah. that's a necessary fragmentation. Because if we don't agree on those things, then we, we actually can't claim right. to well, be unified. Paul says it's to be necessary. Right. That to be it divisions? To yeah. prove faith. Yeah, there has to be divisions to prove faith is true. Mm -hmm. So in that sense too, though, that's a this side of the resurrection statement. It is, yeah. And obviously, well, should, maybe not so obviously, but I think it's pretty obvious. As, well, at least for our listeners, it's probably obvious, is that we're not all Lutheran. We're not all Protestants. We're not all Roman Catholics. And so can we agree on the proclamation of the gospel? Well, if we don't define it too narrowly, maybe. Yeah, right. Can we agree on the sacraments? As the long as the ecumenical definition, it. right? The the broad one. It's just generally yeah. good news. Okay. Right. It's it's just good news, and and the sacraments. Yeah, that's 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 our spiritual participation in in the in the life of the Trinity, right? In the life of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But this goes back to my earlier point again about we can't be too specific about evil, but then can we be specific about good if we're not being specific about evil? And is our is our is that the the reluctance to engage the topic at all? based primarily on, well, I just don't want to cause a rift. I don't want to be seen as the bad guy or, or the troublemaker. Well, contrarian. that's why I mentioned, you know, taking riffing on Luther's um, post-communion collect of faith toward God and love toward neighbor and saying, well, whatever yeah. is opposed to, to faith toward God and love toward neighbor, then is evil. Now, I mean, I, that may be an oversimplification. I don't think so. No. But you still you still run up against the challenge of saying, well, even with that, you still have to say, well, what is what faith of God are we talking about? Or toward God are we talking about? And what does love right. towards neighbor look like? Correct. So then then you're talking about doing something like love for neighbor. You know, it could go either with Ten Commandments, or you can go with Table of Duties if you want to use mm -hmm. catechism, you can go either way. Mm -hmm. Right? In other words, what does God say love for neighbor right. looked like? And Ten Commandments are second table is the that's Jesus Jesus says that's what it is. <laughs> right. That's the summary of the law. Right. Um, and faith or God looks like commandments one through three in our, in our right. numbering, you know, and that, it, it, that seems simple. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it is, but it's not easy, you know, and well, it's not so, easy because I'm, again, I'm thinking, cause it's the topic of, well, the foreseeable future, which is sure. How do you know whether you are encouraging sin or loving your neighbor by abiding by government mandates? Well, I'm trying to figure out where we can shoehorn in those government mandates into commandments four through 10. Mm-hmm. Me too. It, it's this a lot. I mean, so, so then I guess we have to back up or maybe go up a little bit higher level and say, well, how do we get to Romans 13? How does Paul get to that, mm -hmm. that teaching? Or um, he's got similar things in First Timothy and in Titus. Mm -hmm. so he's got admonitions to the pastors mm -hmm. in particular to say, you know, to honor these, these civil authorities and whatnot. Mm -hmm. How do you get to that? Mm -hmm. Instituted by God? Yes, God gave kings. You can see that in, in the history of Israel mm -hmm. after they ask for them. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, to, to mimic the you know, cultures around them. But is that a God's judgment, though? Well, it certainly brings judgment on them. I those was going to say, maybe, because again, if we go with Romans 1, 
God gave them what they wanted most, and it was for their judgment. Authorities? Yeah. Other than God? Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, you get judges. That's, that's what I want. That's what God gives them. You get judges because that's what I want. And they're like, no, we want kings. And he's like, no, you don't need kings. Kings are bad. You don't want kings. No, we, we really want kings. Okay, fine. I'll give you what you want. Because the, the king ends, ends up supplant, supplanting the heads of the household. That's ultimately what happened. You know, so the patriarchs. He, he, he takes over the first table of the commandments because now mm -hmm. we're, we have a confusion of God and man. And he supplants the second table of commandments, like you said, by With taking the, the place of the home, the family. Yeah, the community, the yeah. father. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So then that, we, yeah. <laughs> well, so my my challenge is okay. If they're an authority, um, where where what is the scope of their authority? Right. Well, according to the Reformation, is to protect the preaching of the gospel. Mm -hmm. And the family. Yes. Yeah. Because without the family, there can be no priests, no politicians, and uh, what was the third one? We got church, state. Oh, and uh, parents. Yeah, no parents, no priests, no politicians. Well, if you want to talk about getting a little bit, um, well, the reason why we're having challenge, we're, we're challenged by our political order in this country is that it, it one of four <laughs> pillars of our society mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. are the Ten Commandments. You're right. Um, you know, which applies obviously to both Christians and Jews. Mm -hmm. The um, but the others uh, we're not necessarily as unanimously in support of. So mm -hmm. we have like the Athenian uh, democracy. Mm -hmm. We have the uh, Roman Republic. Yeah. Um, and then we have um, British common law. Yeah. So yeah. so so we have this admixture of of Greek, Roman, English, and I guess we call it Greco Judeo, whatever. You yeah. know, not it's it's this weird mix up mm -hmm. of it's not purely Ten Commandments. There's mm -hmm. a, plenty of philosophy brought in, um, right? Secular philosophy, hum, mm -hmm. you know, humanitarian. Absolutely. Humanist philosophy. And so that's where then the authority thing gets a little bit wonky because you're like, well, are they purely God's authority? Because they don't purely subscribe to God's word. Correct. I, I hate to use that word pure. I don't know. I mean, not even partially. <laughs> not, <laughs> not even, yeah. They tip their hat to it. I suppose. Hey, look, he's going into church on Sunday. That means he's a Christian. And yet and he supports the, the wholesale mm -hmm. death of children in the womb. Correct. Well, the wholesale death of children in other countries too. Children out of the womb too, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what That's do you what do mean, with though, that? We don't even have a public conversation about evil anymore because the mob determines what is good and evil now. Well, so we, we like to condition Romans 13 with um, the other statement, right? We must mm -hmm. obey God rather than men. Correct. <laughs> so to say, well, Romans 13 is true as long mm -hmm. as they're not commanding or directing contrary to God's word. Right. Well, uh, if you know God's word, then you can't do pretty much... I don't know. The federal government is almost entirely opposed to God's word Correct. in many areas. Mm -hmm. So are you now supposed to not submit to their authority? You know, right. because that makes you complicit in evil. Well, I think this is, we go back to it. We treat it like a buffet, right? I'm oh, not going to subscribe to this, but oh, well, that 16th amendment, I mean. You saw, you saw that? That's what I thought too. It's like, well, if we're going to, if we're going to say that no ab amendment is absolute, which was in right. regards to the second amendment um, by our president. Or not our president, but a president. A president. Um, <laughs> you know, well, then I'm like, well, you know what? I'm going to selectively uh, ignore the 16th Amendment. Right. I don't, you know, I don't think the federal, I don't think the federal government uh, should get my taxes. I should just give it to the state. If they want to give some to the feds, that's fine. But, right. you know, I'm like, uh... P.S. Those are not actually to, they're to protect us from the government, by the way. That's not the other way around. <laughs> yeah. I just love the fact that when politicians quote the amendments, they treat it like, well, no, these are for you guys. And like, so we're going to change it. It's like, no, they're to protect us from you. That's why they're there. Right. That's why it's like, shall not, like no government, like government shall not restrict. Like that's you guys. Like it's- Shall not infringe. You. The second yeah. amendment's the only one that has that language, by the way. Right. Shall not infringe. Right. Uh, and and bare arms does not indicate what kind of armament. <laughs> well, actually what's really fun too, is if you want to ever do like a history research program, look at how many of our founding fathers had patents on automatic weapons. <laughs> that's that's awesome. a true story. Yeah. No, they were constantly <laughs> inventing stuff. Like a lot of them were inventors and a lot of them were inventing guns. They were so this is, pro invent this is protecting weapons. their industry is what you're saying? It was. Yeah. It's, oh, I didn't well. know that until like two months ago. And then I was watching a video. I'm like, <laughs> no kidding. And I went down that route. I was like, yeah, they were. They were trying to invent automatic weapons and that's other great. things. But yeah, it's, just, it's fascinating. You're like, shall not it be infringed upon? And you're like, oh, you were trying to get a patent on that gun. Got it.
No, but that I do. I do. You're right. It is to protect. And so the point there is uh, the Second Amendment is the right to defend oneself. That's what it is. Correct. And to defend the liberties um, that are enshrined in the Constitution in particular. Right. Right. No, and that how that's done, it's doesn't. It's not all that specific. So then, what happens if the state says you can't meet anymore? You can't meet in your church anymore. The gospel cannot be preached anymore. The sacraments can't be administered anymore. And to make sure that you don't enter in, we're going to surround this place with guns. <laughs> well, I think we're starting to see some pushback in the legal cases to say, mm -hmm. yeah, no, First Amendment is not going to be violated by medical emergencies. Well, that would be very interesting then because all of a sudden now you put churches in the position, if it does you know, go that way, trend that way, to be, again, outposts basically mm. these little oases in society where you shall it's, not be infringed upon and you know goes right to the practice of religion and well and then the attack will come to say you know well you can't you can't treat churches differently because they of course Correct. have been clear about that the churches can't yes can't have special uh, prohibitions right. put upon it that aren't, don't apply right. to other uh public well, gathering spaces in minnesota it would it would be counted as activism because churches aren't allowed to engage in activism in Minnesota. That's why, like, in, on my church property, we can't post political signage or anything of that nature that is one party or another party. We can't Fine. Do that. Yeah. I don't like either of them. <laughs> exactly. That's my attitude, too. I'm like, well, <laughs> prophetically speaking, I don't like any of them. And practically, I don't like any of them either. Because they're all taking the place of the Father and the, exactly. and the church. And, and, exactly. and with Christ. Yeah. 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 So maybe that's the place to start the conversation for laity with your pastor, with your Bible study group at church, or just when you get together and have coffee is what Gillespie just said, which is mm -hmm. that point of what is the state attempting to replace? Well, God yeah. and the family, which are both God instituted for the good and, of creation. Right. And this is why, um, you know, we've seen not only mandatory, you know, actions being placed upon the church. Mm -hmm. um, but then also on the family, like if you want to have your kid enrolled in school, then you have to do X, Y, Z thing. Yeah. Yes, you do. And yes, if you, you don't do, do them, mm -hmm. um, you know, you might be found in neglect of your children and then, Correct. you know, the, you'll have a social worker show up. By the way. Yeah. That's yeah. You don't want the show. Accredited. You don't want that social worker showing up. No, you don't. And in my state, that's a very real possibility, actually. Yeah. We had to do over a hundred pages of paperwork. But in a sense now you've actually... You're on the radar too. Well, that's a choice. Either yeah. don't do it and then be on the radar in a negative sense or do it and then be on the radar in a less negative sense. But at least you're covered then legally speaking because now that I'm accredited as a, both a principal and a teacher, the state has to then say, well, we did acknowledge that this guy's legit so we can't just send a social worker in to take his kids because we actually said that his curriculum's good. But like you said, I'm still on the radar because you can't get out of it. When I, th I think that probably, you know, just to go back to Vile just for a second with this, is to say uh, the challenge is, um, you know, doing what is good or right or true mm -hmm. is ultimately less knowable than evil. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know what's evil, I, I think, by nature. We know what we ought not do. <sighs> we lie to ourselves that. about it. Yeah. I guess that's the, yeah, you, you conversation about, well, okay. So the conversation about then conscience, because that's mm -hmm. really what you're, you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, the, that's yeah, where I'm going. Post, yeah. post enlightenment conscience is the nature of like knowing good and evil. It's Jimmy Cricket, angel and demon on your shoulder. Pre enlightenment conscience was your sense of standing in relation to God and your neighbor. Mm -hmm. One is the relationship to another. Post enlightenment, it's relation to yourself. It's so still the, the it's point, the same decision muscle, but it, it has a different relative. Right. It's how is this related? Position. How is this affecting my relationship to God versus mm. how is this related, you know, affecting my relationship to myself? Which goes back to your point of in the act of preservation, there is no trace of I. If yeah. you're preserving what God created, you're not in the, you're not in the conversation. But as soon as you put yourself, you insert the I into the conversation. Now it's not about God anymore. Yeah. All right. And therefore the, the enlightenment re like literally like we're going to go in and change the wiki definition of conscience to actually it's a person's sense of good and evil not a person's relationship to the almighty and other people but it's a sense and it's and it's relative then but now i become the sole universal point of reference in the whole universe for what's good and, and evil maybe or or at least 
you know, uh, whatever your tribe is that you've associated yourself with. Mm -hmm. You know, I have those definitions, you know. But it's what benefits me in relation to the tribe, not how I benefit the tribe. So this is the, uh, she's getting at it, I think, as you said, I haven't read read it Mm -hmm. further, but, um, you know, what we, what we do as preachers, what the gospel inherently is, is setting out before you, not from within you, but out before you, the gospel, right. the good, and saying, here's who it is, it's Jesus, mm-hmm. right? And here's, here's what he said, right? right? And he's defining good in a way that you can't, because, right. because like your parents, you, you go after evil continuously, mm-hmm. right? So he yeah. sets it out before you, and then, of course, you know, gives to you the spirit and gives to you the word so that he's always drawing you back into the good, away from the evil, yeah. But it's his work. It doesn't come from within you. Um, but that that also means that it's uh, it's inherently invasive or right. um, aggressive or I don't know, um, offensive even, mm-hmm. right? Well, because it's violent, it's, it's violent yeah. against against your own very nature. This is why Dr. Luther attacked the Schwermerai so well violently, angrily, because mm-hmm. the God withiners were pretty much the you know they pre. They are the, what do you want to say? They are kind of like the, the prototype for the enlightenment <laughs> move to redefine conscience. Which right, is, and ultimately then the postmodern. Yeah, because I don't have to subscribe. I don't have to stand under God's word because God's word's inside of me. I don't have to consult with some outside authority because the truth is within me. Mm, all right. And then, yeah, like you said, you move forward to the enlightenment and then, of course, the postmodernity which is that there is no such thing as truth. There is no such thing as good and evil. There's just the yes or no of my personal taste buds. Hmm. Then you come to church on Sunday, and if your pastor subscribes to an objective understanding, an objective good and evil, an objective, like there's a God, objectively, there's a personality, God. And God is good, and everything else in relation to God is not. Therefore, we need to seek God, where he reveals himself to us, right? Yeah. And... Yet the congregation and even the pastor himself is still, again, this is a postmodern person. Therefore, you are influenced by the culture. You're influenced by the society. So you're unavoidably. Kind of, yeah. Unavoidably. So at least one person hopefully is fighting against that in the pulpit. But yet you're preaching to people who are listening to you saying, this is alien speech. I don't, like, again, I don't have the tools mentally, intellectually to put together what this guy's talking about right now. It really, it really puts a point on, you know, Paul's language of um, being crucified, you know, mm-hmm. to oneself. Yeah, yeah. Right. And then a new man being raised, it's actually different than who you are. And, and that, and that violence of that action, um, anything about in the pew, I mean, it, uh, you, when, when the, it's, I don't know how you want to describe it, but, but when you hear and believe the gospel, you know, you are, it is a kind of a mind out of mind out of uh, body kind of experience in mm-hmm. a way. You know, if the body being the flesh, you're right. you're transcending right. yourself in a way that you don't even you can't even understand. No, absolutely. I I think back quite often on the first first what was it uh, Veterans Day, no Memorial Day. It was the first Memorial Day um, that I ever uh, went to the cemetery for, and the previous interim pastor who was came before me like five six years before me was there too with his wife, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, friend of the congregation, good man actually. Um, but I was standing there talking with two people, and then as members of my congregation got out of their cars, they would wander toward this pastor and his wife with their heads down. And I'm standing off to the side watching. None of them came to me. None of them even acknowledged me. Wow. And I'd been the, the pastor for almost a year at that point. And so I just watched this, and immediately the shepherd and the sheep came to mind because they literally walked toward this guy like like sheep coming into the barn. And... You know, and in that moment, I realized that's their pastor. I'm not their pastor. I'm the guy who works at the church, but that's their pastor. That's the guy they actually wanted to call. And they're like, no, he's an interim pastor. He's not allowed to accept the call. Mm. And then 13 years later, you jump forward to Easter, and all of the people that have joined our congregation in just the past six months, and the exact opposite phenomenon happens, where it's like, no, that's our pastor. He's our pastor. And... Not because of any necessarily like character traits that I possess one way or the other, but rather the recognition of when we came here, we were desperate. And we were told if we came here, it would be different. We didn't know what that meant, but we were so desperate for what was quote unquote different, we came. And then we heard something that we hadn't heard before. 
Right. And the way that you do things here, meaning the liturgy, the historic liturgy, was just weird. <laughs> but yet it was very comforting because it reminded us of something that we hadn't had for a long time. And a lot of people who grew up as kids in, in liturgical churches and then as adults didn't have that anymore, mm. coming back into it, they're like, what is it? I'm like, it's the word of God. You know what, it, it's even epigenetic, I think. Like sure. it, it can skip a generation that, that never experienced it. And mm. yet there's, it's not an even institutional memory because it's not institutional for, for mm. a lot of people. It, it ends up being just this like, well, I think it's because, because the, at least the liturgy as we understand it reflects upon you know, it, it's really a microcosm of the of the macrocosm of the scriptures. It's teaching the the language of the of the Bible. You know, the life of the Christian, de death and you know, dying and rising. Right. It it does the patterns actually jive. The pattern of the liturgy pattern jives with the pattern of the scripture and the pattern yeah. of the Christian life mm -hmm. in such a way that it just makes it. It almost makes sense, and that's why you say it brings comfort because you, you can hear yourself in it. You know where you. Right. You know, you might resonate with the Kyrie more than you do the Gloria some days, right. but that's how it goes. Well, and as I hammer home in, in pastoral care, fear and insecurity are antithetical to the gospel. The gospel drives out fear and insecurity like mm. demons being exercised mm -hmm. from a person. And again, it's not, yes, there's an aspect of the preacher's personality and character that is a part of that. I'm not going to deny that. It's human nature. However, it's not the delivery, it's not the rhetoric or the oratory skills of the preacher. It is the fact that the gospel is the gospel. And when the Holy Spirit preaches the gospel through this instrument, fear and insecurity are driven out. I was going to say, they, in, in one sense, they do learn to listen to your voice or to mm -hmm. recognize your voice as the voice right. of the shepherd. But right. that recognition isn't, isn't inflection. It isn't dialogue. It's not dialect mm -hmm. or something. It's, it's actually the content. Correct. It's actually content. Does this person, mm -hmm. you know, this man who's been put in this place, does right. he actually... Right. Does he actually forgive my sins week in, week out? Right. And this know? is, we, you and I both teach this, and we talk about this in relation to the gospel, that it's the for you of the gospel mm -hmm. that makes it the gospel. And when you have someone or some people that come in and they've never heard the for you ever, like literally ever in their lives, they've never heard this is for you for the forgiveness of sins. That's the thing that makes them pop. It's the for you yeah. of it. Mm -hmm. And like I've said many times before, they hear it, and they recognize there's something different, but they can't really put their finger on it, but like you, it's comforting. Then they come back and hear it again and they start to isolate it. They're like, what, it's that thing. You, you keep saying this is for me. I'm mm -hmm. like, and then, or they'll say, well, you keep saying it's for me as if it's like really for me. I'm like, well, it's not as if it's for you. It literally, is, that's why I'm saying it's literally, yeah, that's why no, you're when looking I around put like... it in your mouth, I say, this is for you for the forgiveness of sins. Now drink it. Is to recognize then when the sheep don't have a shepherd and then they come in and they hear the for you-ness of the gospel. Right. And they eat it and they drink it. Now, all of a sudden, you have people that dip their finger in the water in the font to remind themselves that they're baptized. You have the people who are like, you got to come, you got to come to church because we're having the Lord's Supper on Easter morning. You got to do this. Um, you've got to come and hear this, this guy preach. That's or like, you, or the other end, you say, hey, pastor, can we talk? That too, 100%. Mm -hmm. It's just the sense of the, expect, like, like, it's all about expectations. It's not the guy that's preaching, it's what's preached. It's not that the liturgy is going to wow you because you're singing these and thous or that the hymns are, you know, going to let your hair on fire. It's what's being confessed in those, in those songs. And well, as we know, like you said, if I come to you to repent of my sin, the expectation that you've established as my pastor is there's forgiveness of sins at the end of the confession. Therefore, I'm now set free from the fear and insecurity of wondering, well, how is he going to receive what I have to say? Yeah. Versus, okay, you did this. This is what sinners do. It's part of the Ten Commandments. Obviously, you've come to me and you've confessed your sin, you're repentant, so let me pronounce the absolution over you and then we can move from there. Yeah. When I, and, I, and if you're inserting yourself, the I, into mm -hmm. that at all, mm -hmm. you know, intentionally as a pastor, or if you're allowing others to do that, to bring you into that, mm -hmm. um, it's you know, that, yeah, that's where the evil happens. That's where the evil is found. Because mm -hmm. um, ultimately, what gets undermined? Jesus. And gospel. maybe that's the thing too then, backtracking, is that... What's really difficult for a lot of people nowadays, because mainstream media lies about everything all the time, and you're misled all the time, and, and especially by institutions that you've counted on and trusted your whole life, is recognizing the I behind, well, this is for the public's good, or this is for your benefit, or everyone's benefit. Because mm -hmm. it's always yeah. framed in terms of this is for the good of the, the tribe, the, the, the village, the family, the church, the society. 
But what isn't so clear is the individual person or the individuals that have come together to say this, their motive. And it's yeah. not so much, well, we want to help all of you, y'all, versus mm. I'm being paid a substantial amount of money to say this right now. Correct. And therefore, it is oftentimes then difficult and it produces fear and insecurity because it's so difficult to identify evil at the root because like you noted with in relation to like government and lobbying and every, all the different laws mm -hmm. once you go down that rabbit hole it almost seems limitless well there's yeah there's no limit to the evil oh, wait evil is limitless that's right oh there we go yeah yeah and and, and the the naivete is to say um that that doesn't happen i think that's what right. bothers me where, Correct. Like, and then you drop your guard, and it could be mm -hmm. even in the most godly institution, like your congregation. Right. Well, uh, yeah. As I noted yesterday to my congregation, the greatest gospel preachers that I've ever met in my ministry have all fallen. <laughs> Some of the most flawed as well, because they were also the most flawed people I've ever met in my life. They desperately mm -hmm. needed the good news of Jesus Christ. They preached it like a person who has come just come out of the desert, desert who needs a glass of water. It's because they're actually living in it. Uh huh. And yeah. to watch people that I looked at and went, oh, I could never preach the gospel like that. I could never be, you know, that solid. Um, and then watch them fall and go, oh, wait, that's right. It's not about that. <laughs> it's not about that at all. Get your mm -hmm. house in order. Get your house in order. Don't worry about whether you're preaching the gospel as good as anybody else. Get your house in order. That's what God's given you to do if you're a father. Yeah. Um, and place yourself under the authority of God's word. That's what you can do <laughs> and pray that God would keep you under that authority so that you don't wiggle out and squirm out and, and try and carve out a cult of personality around the ministry for yourself. Or as a Christian in a church, don't carve out a cult of personality in your pew or in the church basement or at the council table. That's not what we're there for. That's evil. That is inherently evil because it's the eye inserting itself again into mm -hmm. the place that only Jesus occupies. And it's trite. In a certain sense, it's cliched in a certain sense. It's too simple in a certain sense. But the fact of the matter is, in our society, currently, I would argue, yeah. and in any generation, there is only one place where you're going to find true good. And that's hmm. Christ at the altar. Not necessarily the congregation where he's preached either. No, <laughs> no, it's a, it's a whole bunch of sinners. There's a whole bunch of eyes competing for yeah, time. Yeah, practically speaking. You it's think about it. the who, of it. Who's the most spectacular character in the entire Bible? Right. John the Baptist. What are his yeah. last words? You know, effectively, I must decrease it. You know, he may increase. increase. Yeah. yeah. You know, well, and, and I mean, he did decrease by oh, yeah. eight to 12 inches. <laughs> Shorter. <laughs> but um, bum. Tsh. I want to pay for that one. <laughs> Nobody got it. And you, you know, yeah. you, you know that he, there's no way he didn't personally struggle with, with that <sighs> call to personality. Are you the one? Yeah, exactly. It's like, why am I here? Yeah. This I mean, is all this is supposed to work. All the region came out to him. Right. Right. And he was impressive, apparently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think we're given the answer later to why the religious leaders were so upset by him doing that, his preaching, after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Mm -hmm. Is that, well, if people find out he's raising the dead, they'll start following him instead of us. And again, there's the I. It's all about me. They're not following me. Well, and, and I think that's probably the greatest evil, you know, for, for us is, to, is for someone to take uh, the preaching of the gospel or the preaching of forgiveness of sins in the case of the priests mm -hmm. and then turn it like Jesus did when he came and turned over the money changer tables, right? Right. It's like, yeah. you've taken this gift of God and you've turned it into really evil. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For personal gain, you know? Right. And uh, so in answer well, to the entire question for this episode about evil... Do you shut down your churches for a pandemic? No. Do you shut it down for the plague? Well, no, we actually have historical precedent that we wouldn't do that. Do you We talked it, about do that. You, yeah. yeah. Do you shut it down for persecution? No. Do you shut it down when your city is being bombed? No. Do you shut it down when the government says we're going to round you up and put you in re-education camps? No. But they, they don't. but they but they might make your life difficult. They will. And if they you're won't. a functioning adult, <laughs> you are free in Christ to stay home. No, that's true too. If you're got a cough, stay home. If you're afraid of getting sick, stay home. I've if had this with to bad be weather people, too. Call your pastor. You know, if you can't drive safely, that too. Yeah, I've got that. If you're afraid of spreading some virus, then call your pastor, and he'll bring the sacrament to you. Mm -hmm. Oh, 
But to live in fear and insecurity, like I said, is antithetical to the gospel. So I would seriously question whether the gospel is being preached in the first place. If fear and insecurity are what rule over a congregation's decision-making process. And just for the record, you know, mm -hmm. your statement, and I would agree with it, mm -hmm. um, is the fruit of not having always done what probably we ought to have done. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Hindsight. True wisdom comes from absolute failure. <laughs> Correct. Repeated absolute failure. Let's put again <laughs> back to the marriage thing. Failure after failure after failure. And then eventually he's like, man, you're really wise. How'd you get this way? Just a long string of failure. Just yeah. catastrophic let me, let me, damage. I can't <laughs> Just, even count the number of times. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no. So you got anything else? No, good. Good. Um, yeah, eventually we might, we might have another podcast or another conversation. But until such time, we'll continue to do this. And as long as 1517 will have us, we will continue to do this. Because it is all about Jesus. And it is all about the gospel and the comfort of the gospel. However, what is comforting about the gospel if you haven't first addressed what is it that takes you away from the comfort of the gospel? Mm -hmm. yeah, You've got to preach the law awfully. You've got to. Um, for, the, for the gospel to truly be preached evangelically, you have to preach the gospel. Um, in relation to the law, um, yep. but keeping them in their proper places and, and keep them distinct. All right. Of thank course. you, Zach. Um, so that being said, thank you as always. Go check out everything else at 1517 articles, podcasts, books, and everything else in between. Donate if you want to donate it. We truly appreciate it. It helps everything that we do at 1517. Otherwise, we will talk to you next week for a brand new episode. Peace. out yes no it's fine <sighs> internet i love the Correct, internet. Zach, limiting or as we call it segregating <laughs> who can come in and who can not come in who can sit where and when yeah i mean make, make no, uh, no no rules prohibiting and whatever yeah mm -hmm. free exercise yeah. right and then then our church is dead <laughs> yes exactly that's right like the I said, Constitution affords the freedom and then we don't even use it. That's <laughs> what I said. We want to be enslaved. We want to be obedient. We can't help ourselves. Oh. We're free to choose a different slave master. Yes. Versus how about not? How about you choose to be a slave for Christ? It's That's so much Paul's easier. Book. So much easier. I talked about doubt yesterday and, you know, the, mm -hmm. the idea that, you know, one response to doubt is to just accept, um, you know, whatever authority wants to take its place or mm -hmm. provide the answer because yeah. it's just easier. Sure. You know, uh, well, and then you much easier. Thank you. Melanie. But then you got Thomas, you know, and Thomas is like, no, I want what you had. I want him. I want to see his wounds too. Mm -hmm. You know, your words. Yeah, it's true. Their words should have been sufficient, but, uh, you know, Hey, seeing is believing. I get it. I asked totally. the that question. Why do you think God wraps his word in water, words, bread, and wine? Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, they gave all their different answers. I'm like, it's because we don't believe him. We just can't believe words. We need more. We need a body in the pulpit. We need bread and wine. We need water. We need something to hold on to. Yeah. No, I agree. We need again objective. We need something objective to hold on to. Otherwise, what do we do? We chuck all the objective stuff so that it goes inside again. We internalize it. Subjective, I blah blah blah. Internalize the gospel. My gospel. My truth. My Jesus. Yeah. On and on and on and on and on. My confidence, my choice. Yes. All of that and everything in between versus, yeah, I don't know. I like, I don't know. We don't live in a warrior society. We don't encourage courage, bravery. Did you of, listen to that, um, that know. interview with, um, with, um, what's his name? Ah, mm -hmm. I sent it to you about the liminal order guy. He's on, he's on uh, Tim pool every other week. Oh, with the beard. Yeah. 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 It's funny you mentioned that. Cause I just, I hit a cl uh, clip this morning. I haven't watched him pool in a very, very long time, and he was Me on the episode. Jack Murphy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, who used to be politically one direction and then switched over politically. Yeah, that's kind of what he's known for. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, he when he got doxxed when he was running a charter school, oh, right, uh, yeah. that kind of that flipped him big yeah, time. Yeah. He was already on the way, but that really mm -hmm. put him over the end, edge. Sure. It's like, oh, you, you people actually eat your own. Yeah, okay, fine. No, it's inter it was interesting listening to him because, you know, he was just talking about what is good. And you said, you know, warrior society, mm -hmm. they, they asked him, you know, like, well, are you, are you going to start a group for women? He's like, no, because this is a masculine virtue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're talking about masculine right. virtues. It's yeah. not for women. They, they're free to do whatever they want. They want to start a group for themselves, do it. 
But that's yeah. not what I'm addressing here. <laughs> like, and ooh. you just got us removed from YouTube permanently. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> How dare you say that? Yeah, that there's a distinction between the sexes? Oh, well. well oh, no, we're supposed to say it, gender now. <laughs> phenomenally speaking, in the past year, when fight clubs, actual fight clubs, have been busted by the police, they have been unanimously men. Really? Yeah, unanimously. No women. At least in the ones that are publicly busted. Yeah, it's always been men. So here, here's a statement. The Liminal Order is an exclusive men's organization. That's already going to get you in trouble. Whose mission is to change our culture by changing ourselves. Mm -hmm. We strive to positive masculinity and believe in the power of individual accountability. Oh my. Mm. <laughs> the men of the Liminal Order know we must improve ourselves such as we may be of better service to our families, communities, and our nation. Mm. There you go. He, he, did, he did make a couple mentions how he's, he was raised, I think, oh, he was in Fort Wayne, Indiana is where he grew up, which I thought... I was like, yeah, um, but he was in a part of an intentionally seg a desegregated school. Hmm. Um, he had a parent who was a Jew and a parent was Roman Catholic, so it was Jewish hmm. Roman Catholic blend. Uh, and they ended up rejecting the faith entirely, any faith. Uh, but he said, you know, through this work, he's become more spiritual, whatever that means. Yeah. You yeah. know, I think he hesitates to be too exclusive, but. Uh, well, and this is an odd phenomenon to, to watch the last couple of years is because I'm in that ecosystem is how many men's groups have all of a sudden sprung up all over the United States and podcasts, after, after, and after folks. they all died, after effectively. they all died out. Exactly. The ones in the church, the ones outside the yeah. church. Yeah. In the early, was it the early, when, when did Iron Jim come out? That was a big deal when Iron Jim came out mid nineties, late nineties, maybe. What was the um, big, what was the big rally to, or the big, um, uh, promise keepers. Yeah. Promise keepers. That was the one I was yeah. thinking. Yeah. And then there was alpha program, same thing. Mm -hmm. Um, at the same time. And then, yeah, in the, in the, the aughts, it kind of just, evaporated and then all of a sudden in the last couple of years you see more and more of the stuff springing up it's just the counter against it has been well these are white supremacist groups it's like the proud boys like the leader of the proud boys is obviously not caucasian and they're like he's a white supremacist it's like um he is distinctly not white well the founder was yes but, but even then, I mean, he had to get out when it started getting too much heat, which is interesting. That's what I'm saying, though, is that the best way to shut down these men's groups then and discourage men from actually seeking out masculinity and, and achieving manhood is to immediately label any men's group as, well, this is white supremacist. You're on the list now. Uh, the problem is, the problem that I see for this is that it actually is like saying, don't, eat, don't focus on those cookies in the cookie jar. You're just encouraging men to look and go, well, what's so bad? What's going on over there? But it's even, it, it's because it's predominantly, um, the people who are most drawn to this are actually not Caucasian. Exactly. Because, because it's not a white thing. It's about emasculation. Right. Because, and you look at like how many, how many, uh, what is it? 70 some percent of African-American children are raised Grow by a single a mother. Exactly. Exactly. And th those are the communities that recognize this more than anybody. 100%. That, that we've, we've. Absolutely. So in a weird way the the cult of of wokeness has actually promulgated the rise of fight clubs and the rise of men's retreats because this is the thing that resonates then is that the people that go to these things are not you know manly men so to speak they're not ufc fighters these are accountants and waiters and guys who drive uber and it's a whole generation like with fight clubs a whole generation of millennials now who are looking around going what the hell <laughs> Like what, yeah. what, what, what's my place in society? Because everything around me is telling me I have no place in society. I need to apologize for who I am, not just my skin color, but my gender. And then you meet other people and they're like, yeah, I was where you were at three years ago, dude. Like I was with you three years ago. I was mm -hmm. crying, talking about my feelings and, you know, calling myself a male feminist and all this stuff. And then I found these guys and I got into this stuff and now this is where I'm at and you should try it. You know, it's like, uh, on the other side, it's like when I invite women to join Muay Thai, and then women start hitting pads and kicking pads and they get that all of a sudden it starts to kick in, especially moms, <laughs> they get that violence coming out of them all of a sudden they're like, this is the best thing I've ever done. Mm. And all of a sudden they're buying pads and they're making their husband, you know, hold pads for them and they're buying heavy bags and they're doing all this stuff at home because they recognize that there's been something missing from their lives, which is just the ability to like, in a positive way, just like expel that, that anxiety and the resentment and, and feeling out of control in their lives and everything's about everybody else all the time and it's like they come and they engage in that controlled violence and all of a sudden it's like oh finally 
Well, that's why I said, I mean, I know it it makes people uncomfortable, but like, well, Mm -hmm. no, that's actually a gift. It's showing you what you care about, showing Mm -hmm. you what matters. Actually, Steve will appreciate this. Steve's a member of my church. Uh, Yesterday, uh, one of the women in my Muay Thai class, who's also a member of my church, made the comment, she's like, whenever we're upstairs in church, I'm thinking to myself, man, I wish there were Muay Thai today. (laughs) So, like, I got all these women in church who are like, yeah, Muay Thai's at three. We just got to get through church, and then we get to go to Muay Thai. I'm like... Mm. <laughs> I appreciate that, but <laughs> oh, there's Focus some problems. People. There's some problems here. Yes, yeah. So I, I, th- I do. I think that this is gonna. It's well, we talked about this last year already. That it's creating this whole underground society. Mm-hmm. We've and, seen this politically too, though, right? Right. Right. It's like if you allow you know, the terrible people to do the terrible things, then mm-hmm. the people see the terrible things and they say, Correct. oh, we didn't know that's what you meant. Yeah, we know. Regrets, yeah. regrets, you know, but you can still push back. I mean, there's still time. Yeah. I'd like to believe that there is anyway. Yeah. Well, mm, I think... What Some way, happen- anyway. Well, it's, yeah. In any authoritarian state, that's what's going to end up happening. And no, I'm not going to referee your tournament. Um, <laughs> geez. Thanks, though. I appreciate the uh, the shout out. Yeah, hey, I'd like to be a referee for a fight. No. Um, it's recognizing that the things that are missing have to be created locally. And we've talked about this a lot. Yeah, yeah. Is that when you recognize something missing in society, don't try and change society. Change your family. Change your household. Like you say, get, get your house in order. Yeah. Get your house in order. And then serve your local community, whether it be through food distribution, whether it be through starting a cloth, you know, clothing drive or, or food shelf or daycare Whatever it is that you see, or even starting a black market economy, hypothetically. <laughs> is it, is it a black illegal... market? I mean, well, in Minnesota, it is because there's just certain things that you're not legally oh, supposed to okay. buy unless they've been processed and irradiated. <laughs> so, and pasteurized, yes. Hypothetically, if one were to create that kind of economy, <laughs> that is what you would do, though. You would recognize there's a need, and other people would express a need, and then you would engage in promoting the livelihood and the, and the well-being of people in your community so that they can sustain their families and, and live well, um, whatever that means. But recognizing no one's coming to save you from the state. Nope. Like no one's, the federal government's not going to save you. They're, they're not they're going to save you from... Is, why yeah. would they save you from... What the, they've done to yeah. you? Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's like that stimulus checks just so that they can raise taxes. That's the only reason they're giving you the stimulus money is so they can raise or taxes. Dest- or destroy the dollar so that they can replace it with something Simultaneously. else. Simultaneously. So they yeah. can replace it with the yen, yeah. yeah. Yep, Russia, China, and South Korea, baby. Um, <laughs> New but, superpower. Yeah, and hey, thank you, Wes, by the way, if you're still there, Wes, thanks for the question, that was good. I, yeah, I, that was, yeah, we got you know, to it eventually. On, that was on the back burner. <laughs> That's our entire podcast. We'll get to it eventually. Anyways, fight segregation at, for any reason, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I agree. Fight mandatory vaccination for any reason, as far as I'm concerned, um, because it's the body that God gave to you. It's a gift, and you're whether you're going to put it in you or not. You fight right. against mandatory. That's what I'm yeah. saying. Like I don't care if I don't care who you are. I will fight for your First Amendment right to express yourself, even if you're a stone cold Satanist. Like I actually train with Satanists. Like I have a friend who's a Satanist. He's my friend. I love him. He's a great guy. He's going to burn in hell for eternity, but he's still a great guy. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I was um, watching. I was watching a British show yes, uh, yesterday because uh, I liked the the Mitchell Webb look. I don't know if you remember mm-hmm. that comedy mm-hmm. show. I didn't know they had done another show since then. It's a sitcom mm-hmm. um, that's actually pretty good. It's really dark, really dark. Uh, it's called Back. Um, anyway, it there's all sorts of strange psychology going on in it. Uh, but mm-hmm. they there's the priest and he's talking to the mom who's totally dysfunctional and uh, walking along and he's like. He's like, you know that you, you know, it's it's Jesus alone and no one else. And unless you believe in him, you're gonna burn yeah. forever in hell. And he's like, she's like, well, what about my husband who died in the first episode? Mm-hmm. You know, what what about him? Oh no, he's burning in hell. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> what show like, is this? It's called Back. B a c k. It's a, it was on. Uh, I think it was Channel Four, maybe. I can't remember. It's a BBC I'd, show, though, right? I'm not sure if it was. Let's see. It may have not been Channel Four. I had to do a lot of look and find it. Hmm. Uh, and then they took like three years off and they did season two here. It came out this last year. Oh, no kidding. Okay. Yeah. It just got back. The, Interesting. I know. Where'd you find it at? Oh, I don't know. I was, I was like, well, whatever happened to Mitchell Webb look? And, you know, because the show stopped Is it on way Amazon back. or just? Uh, second series was announced in 2017 and didn't air until 2020. Hmm. The, 
they do this yeah it was channel four mm. so i don't i don't know how you can get it's it it's probably on youtube it's probably on youtube everything's on youtube if you know how to search for it <laughs> i'm amazed at the things i can find on youtube just uh yeah so there's probably episodes two sixties and episodes that are like six years apart i don't know how the british do that these little short series and nope there it is simon blackwell is the the writer hmm. who is known for oh mitchell and web i gotcha yeah 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 here we go nice. but it uh man it's really it's really dark cool. and also pretty crude and vile so even better it, it has all the good stuff <laughs> very good so anyways i gotta make a call to my publisher p.s to everybody who's still here i'm writing a book it's based on the screw tape letters it'll be out in 2022 November 2022, I guess, is when it's supposed to come out. So I'm working on that right now. And um, yeah. So thanks, Paul, right. Melody, right, Alicia, well, Zach, everybody. We, Thank you. And the broadcast. Very good. I'm trying anyway. Click the I'm right button here. To do it.